Hey, good evening, everybody. It's a, uh, it's a really important show tonight because, as you know, for the last three years doing these live streams, I've talked many times about the IX Art Show, formerly known as the LuxCon and the Imagine of Realism Arts. Uh, we've talked about it a great deal. I have anyway, and you've listened. So tonight we get to meet the gentleman who started the IX Art Show, a longtime friend of mine, Patrick Wilshire. And uh, his better half, Jeannie, is not with him tonight, but uh, she is was part of the slide. I was hoping she could be with us, but she's on vacation for another day. But uh, let us uh, let me bring my good friend Patrick into the show tonight. Hey, Patrick, how are you doing? Hi, pretty good. Good evening, everybody. So uh, it is a good evening indeed. And I, I even put over, I, I made a couple announcements out there, even on the IBA forums and whatnot to let people know we were doing this. So hopefully we'll have some familiar faces in the chat tonight. But so Patrick, uh, you know, we've known each other for quite some time and we used to be relatively close to one another when I lived in Ohio. Now I've, I've moved far, far away, unfortunately, <laughs> but, uh, but you've been, uh, you, have you always been a resident of PA? Uh, no, I, I was born in PA. I grew up, born and grew up in Altoona. Um, but then, uh, I went to graduate school in North Carolina, uh, for a while, um, and then back to Penn state and then back to North Carolina for a couple of years. And then, uh, in DC for a couple of years, um, which is where I met Jeannie when I was living and working in DC and we decided we both hated DC. Um, and, uh, so I told the, I was working for a government contractor as an instructional designer. And I told them that, you know, they could either replace me or let me telecommute full time. Um, this was in 2002 and they said, okay, well you can telecommute full time. Uh, so then we moved back to, to where I was from cause Jeannie happened to find a job here. Fantastic. So you were irreplaceable, I think is what you learned from that. <laughs> <laughs> or, or at least it was, it was more of a pain to replace me than, than, uh, you know, to just let me do my stuff. Exactly. So, uh, you know, before we get into, you know, things that you're, you've been currently work on, working on, tell me a bit about your, uh, your history as an art collector, because I think, you know, we met early on in the days of CAF. I think when I, I noted it as part of the show description that you, you've had a gallery since 2005. Mm -hmm. And even at that point, you were seen pretty well entrenched in original art, art collecting, you know, on this, on the, in the genre of fantasy, science fiction, horror, that sort of thing. But, but kind of, how did you guys get started? I mean, it, it seems, seems like, uh, it, was it early, even before you met Jeannie, or was it something that yeah. kind of generated itself? Oh, yeah. So. yeah, I started, um, I, I bought, I, I'm an inveterate collector. Um, I've, I've collected a wide range of things. Uh, starting when I was little, I collected baseball cards, um, you know, and uh, I was obnoxiously serious about it. Um, you know, I remember my, my parents still love to tell the story of uh, my grandfather had this antique trolley that he had left to me. And uh, they decided to let me sell the trolley to buy a really fancy baseball card for my collection because that meant a lot more to me than the trolley did. And uh, so it, I was, I don't know, maybe eight, nine, something like that, and went to a card show in Pittsburgh, and I was looking for a uh, greenback T206 Ty Cobb uh, is what I wanted, and I was interviewed, but the little radio TV was there. And they, oh, little kid, they asked me, oh, well, what are you looking for, a uh, T206 Ty Cobb? Um, and they just, you know, <laughs> I did find one, um, you know, so, but I did that. I collected, uh, anime cells for a while, original anime cells. Uh, I've collected uh, first edition fantasy and science fiction books, um, which was helpful and useful. Um, I collected comic books, obviously like everybody, um, you know, but then I, I, at one point I went to, there was a dealer, uh, in Maryland, uh, whose name escapes me now. Uh, this is. This is 1995. Um, I was doing Maryland and he dealt in anime cells and also had art. And so my friend Ralph and I went down to see him to look at the anime cells that he had. And in his storage thing, he had, you know, Ken Kelly prelims and Hildebrandt prelims and an Olivia Pastel and, you know, and, and I had out all the card sets and I started to play D&D from the time I was 10. And, and I was just enthralled beyond belief that these things could actually be bought, you know, and they weren't all like tens of thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. um, so I, 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 th I think I bought a Ken Kelly prelim um, and like a layaway on the Olivia, which I think was $900 at the time. Um, and that was, they were the first two things. 
Um, and, and from there, everything else went out the window um, and just collected that. And I did that until I met, you know, I was doing that when I met Jeannie. Mm-hmm. My apartment was full of, of stuff. Um, and I remember I, I brought her over to the apartment for the first time. And, and I, I, I literally, I said to her, this is here. You're going to have to live with it. You know, it's not going anywhere. It's, it's, you know, and uh, fortunately she liked it. Um, you know, so, so we then went forward on, on from there and just, you know, more and more and more and more and more and more and focus shifted. I originally did nothing but TSR art, um, you know, and then expanded because there were so many artists that never did any work for TSR, you know, so, so we, but that, that's kind of how it, that's kind of how it actually started. So it's actually been almost, good God, almost 30 years. Um, at this point, and, and I've gone from being invariably the youngest person in any conversation, uh, you know, or any room to not the youngest person in any conversation. Or any the longer room. you're in it, the older you get. Yeah, <laughs> that's, uh, kind of, that's unavoidably seems to work that way. Yeah. So, what did uh, you know before you ran into that art, though, uh, with, with the animation cells? I mean, what kind of stuff were you collecting then? Uh, I predominantly collected anime cells. Yeah. Um, I was doing, of course, at the time, this was in the early nineties, mid nineties, you know? And so I, in my brokenness, uh, post-grad school, uh, was actually able to be buying, you know, Miyazaki cells and Lotus War cells and, you know, uh, because they weren't that expensive, you know, at that point. Um, so that's pretty much what I was, what I was collecting in terms of the cells. Um, you know, I had random things from, from stuff, but my, the main thing I was was the most going after is I was collecting Lotus War and I was collecting Miyazaki. Oh, very nice, very yeah. nice. But but once you discovered Ken Kelly prelims and uh, and similar stuff that you that you were done, you were, okay. you were ready to move on. Well, it was a case of you know there was only so much money. Yeah. Um, you know, and it was a case of I couldn't at the time when I dis- I had I still had my book collection, I had the anime stuff, you know, and it all got sold out the window to help pay for art because there wasn't enough money for me to collect more than one thing. Um, you know, and collecting the art was hard enough, you know, as it was, because in order to buy anything, I had to be utterly irresponsible uh, financially in order to buy stuff, which I did. Um, well, we know. all know, we all know that feeling, Patrick. Yeah. So, so did you keep anything? I mean, from those early, you know, the, the books or the uh, animation no. cells, everything, no. everything was you everything, were done with everything. Everything went. Yep. You know, in retrospect, in retrospect, there's some things I would have kept. Um, you know, I, I would have kept the beautiful first edition of Neuromancer um, just because I could have sold it for a lot more money now than I did then. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, but but yeah, everything went out the window. The only thing I, is I still had some I still have some comics. Um, just stuff that's not really worth any money, like the Eagle Comics, Judge Dreads, mm-hmm. um, you know, but just things I like to read. You know, the random beat up, chili stained Savage Swords of Conan. Uh, you know, I still have a few of those those kinds of things. But pretty much everything else, it's just it's just art. You know, it, the whole house, is, it's, it's just filled with art. Um, except except I now have a new hobby, um, you know, that, that, that kind of fills stuff, you know, up to. Uh, yeah, I started collecting uh, uh, game-worn Steelers uh, jerseys, helmets, that's right. I forgot about that. You're one of those Steelers fans. I want. I wanted a hobby. I mean, because now, since for the last seven years, I guess, or almost seven years, uh, you know, the this is a living. I mean, IX and IX galleries have yeah. a living, and so I wanted a hobby that to have a hobby that wasn't in any way connected to money, making money, paying the mortgage. You know, one that was just purely fun that I didn't have to pay any attention to anything other than. Oh hey, I'd love to have that and put it on a mannequin in my office. Um, so that's why I did that. So that my office is filled with that. The entire rest of the house is filled with art. So uh, Mr. Easy Galucky wanted to know if uh, you still owned either the Olivia or the uh, Ken Kelly that you had picked up. No, no, I, I have subsequently owned uh, other Ken Kellys. Uh, you know, full Ken Kelly. I've owned I don't know five or six Ken Kellys, um, and I did I did own a beautiful major. Uh, Bain, uh, uh, Bain t- period Olivia, uh, which I sold a couple of years ago. Well, 
That's, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Not many people have their uh, first pieces of art still in their possession. It just doesn't uh, doesn't happen too often. Sometimes, but uh, but not always. I don't know in the stuff that I bought, you know, the thing, the pieces that turned me on to collecting original art. Yeah, I sold those long, long ago. Yep. But so, uh, you know, where, so how did, you know, clearly you got the bug. It doesn't really, you know, I think in original art collecting, once you get it, uh, you know, you're you're hooked forever. I mean, you know, you're you're kind of delving off into, uh, you know, traditional painting pieces, TSR, those sorts of things. You know, we're going after comic art pages, but it's the same sort of thing. I stopped collecting comics when I realized I could buy art. You know, and I and I sold all my comics in order to buy more artwork. Mm -hmm. It's you know, it's a similar similar story that we all definitely share. Um, but so, how did you know? How did that? Uh, Tell me about like the first five years. I mean, you know, when you first started buying, where where were you buying outside of the storage facility that you oh. happened to run into because of the animation cells that they had? Um, the first five years, um, I, I, I got greatly. I discovered Jane Frank um, yeah. and and her Worlds of Wonder. Jane was the dealer um, and 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 rep in in the field in that time period. Um, and uh, I can talk more about her later because there's a couple of pieces in the thing that actually are related to that. Um, but uh, I discovered her and then I was on eBay. Uh, it was the early, you know, and I met uh, from listing, they were buying things and having, you know, I met several collectors um, that I'm still friends with that are still major collectors, people like Greg Spatz mm -hmm. um, and Joe Brewers and, you know, Greg Oba. I met those people then on ebay and then we became friends and started sort of doing stuff and then they would hey I, yeah boy do you know Stu schiff you know and then they would introduce me to Stu schiff and then you know and then you know victor drex and then all the so they kind of gradually got to know everybody um and and then i started uh going directly to artists um and i started with you know hey will you sign my cards and do you have any pencil sketches um, and, uh, and a tip that I also use that worked very effectively more than once, um, is do you have any paintings that you hate? <laughs> and, um, you know, that how, I, how often did they say yes? Uh, occasionally every artist has stuff they hate. Yeah. Uh, now they may or may not be willing to unearth it. Um, but every artist will have things they hate and normally they hate it for reasons that have nothing to do with how good it is. Uh, they hate it because the art director was miserable they hate it because their ex-wife modeled for the painting. You know, they hate it because it they finished it the day their dog died. I mean, it's, you know, it's something that's a perfectly good painting that they just loathe. And so I was able to convince some people to sell things very cheaply because I'll just, I'll just throw this away. You know, um, and I, no, no, throw it away. It's dead. You know? <laughs> um, art. So, so I started you know, reaching out to artists. Um, you know, I would, would find addresses for them and I would write to them. Um, and I, I think I, the one, I, one thing I do still have from early on is I have a binder uh, full of the letters that I got back from the artists um, where they would send me back a little sketch or they would send me back a letter saying, yeah, I've got these pencil drawings in there, X, Y, Z. Um, I kept those, that binder full of letters I still have. Um, which is really fun because, of course, a lot of the artists that are in there are good friends of mine now. Right. Um, you know, or became very good friends. And so it's kind of funny to look and see, you know, kind of the original. Oh, one thing. I have one piece from, from way early on. Okay. I wrote a really nice letter, apparently, uh, to Jeff Miracola, a uh, magic artist. Yeah. Uh, Jur Juror in IVA 11. Okay, yep, and asking him about, uh, you know, did he have any sketches, anything inexpensive that he would sell? And he wrote back and said that he really liked my letter and it was really nice. And so he did an ink drawing, uh, like a Grim Reaper kind of thing with a sigh, beautiful ink drawing, and sent it to me. Um, and that I still have. Um, that, yeah, that's something you can't get, give away, right? Once once you get a, get a gift like that. Yep, that one I still have. Uh, the other really early thing I still have, which isn't that early, but it's fairly early, uh, as I would, was ma I made good friends with RK Post. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, TSR, he was working for D&D at the time. Oh, yeah. And uh, he was doing the uh, third edition monster. They were working on the third edition monster manual or monstrous, monstrous manual, I think it became then. 
And um, so I negotiated with him to put my name in one of the drawings. Um, so in the dryad piece, it's a pencil drawing and then digitally colored. But in the pencil drawing, in the shadowing, in the folds of the robe, it says Pat W. And wow. so I still have that. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't let that one go either. <laughs> I still have, but those are the two like early, early things that I still have. Um, you know, the rest of the stuff early, early is, is, is gone. Now, uh, you know, in your travels, I, I know I've brought this up with you numerous times and I mentioned it to the audience quite, well, pretty much every time I mention IX, I always mention this as well, but did you ever own any spot illustrations by Bill Willingham from the early D and D days or Jeff D? I mean, I, I have some Jeff D villains and vigilantes art, so I at least have sort of got something from that era, but Willingham, nothing, never seen it, a single thing. Uh, never owned any interiors by them. Uh, I owned the back cover to Queen of the Demon Web Pits. Ooh, that would have been uh, you know that one. I owned the cover to Queen of the Demon Web Pits. Um, I also owned the cover to Descend into to, uh, uh, Vault of the Dragon, or Descend into the Depths of the Earth. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, I sold both of those, unfortunately. I know where they are, the person I sold them to still has them. Uh, but when I sold all the I sold a lot of the, the TSR stuff. And uh, so, yeah, I owned those. I owned Trampiers. I owned Rosloff's, um, you know, and Elmore's Parkinson's, you know, other, you know, early interiors. Sure. But I don't think I ever had any of these. I never had a Willingham. I don't think I ever did see a Willingham. Um, I saw one somewhere. It was a painting somewhere. I don't think I bought it. I, I, I didn't, but, but it was on eBay or something in like 2001 hmm. uh, or something. I, I have seen one, but that's it. See, I've never even seen one, so... I've got that working against me. I just feel like they, they just don't exist. It's like the PSR, PSR destroyed a lot of them. Yeah. Well, they no, kept I... them and then they, they trashed them. Um, a lot of what's out there was rescued. Uh, Jim Rosloff, uh, in addition to being an early artist, was an art director. Mm -hmm. at PSR, um, and he managed to save some of his own pieces. Um, but also there was uh, a number of things that got saved. There's an artist named uh, Diesel. Dave LaForce, who was yeah. a photography, um, he rescued a bunch of stuff from a dumpster, actually. Um, so that's where a number of the things that got saved. Uh, the major uh, hardback paintings and stuff are out there. Uh, they all, they all, you know, the Player's Handbook and the original Monster Manual, they all survived. They're all out there. I know where, where all of those are. Um, you know, the original Errol Otis um, box set cover survived it's at wizards they found right. it in the warehouse a few years ago um and of course everything later survived that's uh i know it's it's a shame i mean the, the same story holds true in a lot of uh, you know for, for comic book artwork too at least you know certainly on uh, well for both major publishers over the years but early on you know people didn't really value the work either they got the you know once they got the stats or something like that or they were reproduced once the original wasn't, uh, you know, the, where, where are you going to store it, right? At the end right. of the day, uh, space is limited, so the dumpster it goes. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's that's uh, that's good to know that uh, uh, Rosloff was able to, to save a few things. I mean, I've always loved his, his work, too. But mm -hmm. uh, I'm yeah. glad he was instrumental in pulling a few things out of the garbage. Yeah, there's, and there's, there's a fair number of, of Rosloff's pieces that survive. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're still out there. Um, and and stu stuff, you know, it's... A lot of it is there. It's just incredibly, of course, now it's pretty much all in Hong Kong, um, you know, with, with very limited exceptions. Um, you know, I think Matt told me the last, he has 900, he was cataloging his collection and he had 900 pieces cataloged so far. Um, you know, so a large chunk of, of it is there. There's a few serious collectors that have held out that won't sell. Everything that kind of randomly comes up typically ends up. Um, typically ends up in Hong Kong now for TSR. Now, was, it, was he going to do some kind of a museum? Yeah, he's going to open a museum, um, I think in the UK or, or, or the US. Um, it's interesting, same thing. I've been, I had not done much of anything with Games Workshop, um, you know, but lately I've been working with a couple of other collectors um, on, on Games Workshop stuff, mm -hmm. uh, you know, early Warhammer, you know, 40K and, and Warhammer. Right. Um, and it's starting to go the same way as TSR. Uh, the early stuff, uh, unlike TSR, where they kept it and threw it away, it seems like Games Workshop probably still has it, but they apparently took a lot of the art and have just kept it. 
Um, so there's not a lot of early, there's relatively little early stuff available. Um, and so it's difficult to find and getting pricier and pricier by the year. I see Tim Frederick says, uh, I would give a decent amount for one of the ones I sold to Matt a while back. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> right. Now nope, that's, uh, I get it. You know, there was, uh, there was definitely a push and you were, you were, you helped in that. I know you helped, uh, you know, Matt acquire a few of the pieces, oh, yeah. but, um, but you know, that's cause you had the background and you had the connections and everything. So nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Uh, at least you, you know where it all is. And if it becomes part of a, a museum that we can all appreciate one day, that would be fantastic. I think just because yeah. I've never gotten to see a lot of that stuff. It will uh, be, it will be very, very nice. Um, you know, when, when that, that happens, it'll be really good. Uh, there's another, there's actually a museum that's going to be open sooner. I suspect than Matt's. Uh, it's a broad fantasy and science fiction museum that we have been uh, working with with the guy to source art for about a year and a half, two years now. Um, that's going to be that's going to open in Edinburgh. Oh, okay, that's um, not and, bad. Give you give you a reason to make a trip, I guess, right? And it, it's it's going to be yeah, it's going to be cool, and it, and that's going to be up long before Matt's is up, I think. Okay. Um, so, how do they choose that location? I guess. Um, that's their, their, uh, the, the person is, is a Scotsman and that's where he's retiring. That's to. where he's, okay. That's his, okay. he's going to go and, and, and do the museum. So, nice. so that would be very cool. That, that, that's, I, that's going to be a neat, that's going to be actually, that's going to be really, really nice. Um, so when do you think we'll be getting some announcements about that, that we can share? Oh, talk about? oh probably it's going to be talking two years, three years. Okay. You know, but but it, it will it will happen, and it's 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 going to be pretty awesome. Sweet, well, I I can't wait. I mean, I, maybe I'll uh, I'd love to I'd love to go. I mean, shoot, that would be pretty incredible to see mm -hmm. oh, yeah. any type of uh, you know artwork like that. You know, and so so early on, going back to where you when you were sending letters out and uh, just trying to feel and find certain things. Um, you know, at that point in time, you know, I, that, that's about when I started going back to to cons as well, but there was really you really didn't have a venue mm. per se to find artwork like this i mean you know not too many you know ken kelly might have gotten out a few times here or there to different shows some of you know there were certain artists that you might have seen but outside of that uh you know what would what did what did the uh where would you go i mean dragon con or would you go to the uh some of those science fiction shows you might get you might see some art there but but what what really were the avenues outside of jane frank to yeah. buy this artwork sci-fi shows i didn't go to any actually but world con and world fantasy uh were the primaries i did go you know like you go to gen con mm -hmm. you know dragon con um san diego uh you know there are a lot of artists uh not so many of them doing it now now that it's gigantic and expensive and pop culture you know but you know in the in the 90s and early aughts people like donato and greg manchester and probably those guys would go and would do san diego um, so you go there, uh, chiller theater actually, uh, in Jersey, uh, Ken Kelly would do chiller. Bob Eggleton would do chiller. Um, and so you would, you would see those, you know, you, you would kind of see them there. Um, but once I met, you know, I just started going to, to visit artists. Um, when, whenever somebody, like when I lived in North Carolina, I found out that Scott Burdick lived in North Carolina. And so I went to his studio and met him and visited with him and, and purchased one of the paintings that he hated um, and, uh, and brought back home. Um, shortly after I met Jeannie, the first thing I did, I took her, we went to visit Mark Zug. Oh, sweet. Uh, and uh, so we you know, met with Mark and you know, the Mark stuff and the things. And, and uh, so that's kind of, we started just sort of, you know, internet, internetting with people, phone and, and internetting with people. Um, and then, but, but you would just, you could visit people when you happen to be somewhere where they were, uh, you know, like we happened to honeymoon in upstate New York. So we spent one day of our honeymoon visiting Steve Hickman, um, because he lived up in that area. Um, you know, so that, that's kind of, you know, what you would do, but there, there really wasn't a, there wasn't a, a particularly great venue. Uh, uh, so, you, so you really didn't go out to those shows that you mentioned, Gen Con. Or, you know, the, no. I, I, I've been to Gen Con and Dragon Con in San Diego, but I didn't go frequently because yeah. you know there was there was stuff, 
you know, I, I went to Gen Con, I came home with art. I went to Dragon Con, I came home with art. I mean, but, you know, but it wasn't, it was, it was, it was, it was inefficient. Um, you know, it, it was much more efficient to, you know, just kind of source the things directly and take the money that you would have spent going to the event and spend it buying art instead. Right. I mean, I remember when I first started going to San Diego um, around 2002, you know, they did have a science fiction fantasy section. It wasn't very big. It was about two, two aisles, maybe. Um, but it, yeah, it, and today it's almost non-existent. I mean, I, I know I saw Dave Seeley there this last year, but, uh, but there really isn't much of a presence. A, you know, Alan Williams used to go there s sort of frequently for a while between like 2010 and maybe 2018. But, but yeah, by and large, I think everybody's just realized it's just not, you know, it's not, not a good venue for artists anymore of any kind, sadly. No, no it's just, it's, yeah, it's, it's, so, you know, that's, you know, the, the, I mean, at this point, Uh oh, Patrick's frozen for a second. Oh, I'm back. I gotta oh, go. You're back. Yep. Uh, you know, Dragon Con is much better. Yeah. Um, you know, the the World Fantasy and World Cons were the thing, and then they got bad, um, and had not good stuff. And they've been kind of working on resurrecting the shows and having better art shows and better things, and they're they're getting better. So they're worth looking into. If, uh, but there's still, I mean, there's art, there's art shows, they have the art thing, but the focus of world con world fantasy is literature. Um, exactly. That's the, the primary focus of those things. Uh, pulp con is good. I have not been to uh, Windy City. Um, I keep hearing, isn't that like soon, like yeah. a week or two from now? I mean, I, I, I've heard such good things about that. It's, I, I, I know I, it's a small show, but I think, it's one that I think you know. If you're in a fan, a fan of this genre, it's one that it's a show that most people like to go to. Yeah, I regret that I've not made the trip up there yet, but it's everybody talks about it. I mean, just it's it's uh, surprising. But mm -hmm. there are again, there's just not many shows like that out there. No, no, and uh, you know, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a niche. Um, you know, there there's a lot of people who love fantasy and science fiction. Um, you know, and, and who love the imagery and who love the artwork, um, the actual number of people who are buying substantive amounts of relatively or more expensive originals is, is, is a small group. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you know, it's getting bigger. It's better. Um, you know, it's improving. You know, we, we sell stuff to new people every month at this point. Um, you know, but it's it's still a relatively niche. Yeah, that's uh, that's the way it is. So, uh, you know, tell me about the gestation of. I mean, we're kind of skipping through your collector time here. I mean, maybe I shouldn't even jump into IX yet. I mean, any more collector story, or you know, that you have, you know, these interactions with artists. You know, you go into their studios. You mentioned Hickman, which I imagine would have had to have been a, a you know, pretty special. I've always loved Hickman's work. We've yeah. uh, we've highlighted a few of his paintings on uh, the updates I do every week. So, I mean, you know, huge fan and uh, huge loss, obviously. Um, but what, what other creators, uh, and, you know, did you manage to get into their studios or their homes just to kind of talk to them? Uh, let me see. Not actually that, I mean, not Jane's house. Yeah. Uh, you know, the Jane Frank's house, which was Jane. like a museum. Yeah. She's now, she's now, moved since Howard passed away. She's moved out West, but they, she lived in DC mm -hmm. uh, in a 7,500 square foot house in DC that was packed um, with, and it was, it was amazing. I mean, it was, it was the most unbelievable display that you will ever see. Um, well, there will be nice museums that won't have what Jane and Howard had, um, you know, in terms of, of, the, the quality of what they were exhibiting. Um, I mean, it was, it was amazing. Uh, but we, we went, we, we went to, we visited, um, you know, we've been to, uh, well, we visited Boris and Julie. Um, you know, we, we, we've gone and, and to back, that's where, that's where IX came from. Actually was from a visit to Boris and Julie. Um, you know, uh, but not a lot, cause there's not a lot in, in the area, in, in the arena, mm -hmm. you know, uh, so it was, it was more, it was more, you know, talking to people, um, you know, lots of phone calls. I had a, I had a, a 
I still have it actually somewhere, but I have a little, a black, literally, literally a little black book about yay big, um, that Jeannie decorated with uh, cutouts from Dragon Magazine, uh, you know, glued all over the front of it to make this little collage uh, kind of thing where I kept all of the names and phone numbers that I managed to track down, um, especially for, for all of the, you know, the oddball TSR folks and, you know, and, and on and on and on, you know, from there. And, uh, you know, so, you know, I spent a lot of time on the phone, <laughs> um, sure. you know, and then email. Uh, I mean, it was, I, I started email. I, I would use, uh, we didn't have internet at home yet, uh, but we did at the office where I was working. Just my boss's computer um, had, had dial up. And uh, so I would get her permission that I would get to work early and I would go in and get on her computer and use use that to email people uh so that i could email artists uh so i would i distinctly remember getting emails from rob rupel mm -hmm. you know that way you know on 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 my boss's computer sure so and even have fun uh i remember one of the well one of my uh, when i like i i i got uh, i got got by an artist um, oh, yeah. how, how, how did that happen? Uh, I was, was emailing and, and I'd asked, I was trying to, to, uh, I wanted a Brahm, you know? And so I was emailing with Brahm and, and, uh, I'd emailed him about, <laughs> ask about something. And he's like, oh yeah, well, let me check and I'll, I'll get back, you know? And I hadn't heard anything for like a week or so. So I just, you know, I followed up and, and I got this immediate email back saying, you know, Look, you're a real pain in the ass. I don't have time to look for that now, so stop bugging me. <laughs> and I very nearly just expired right at that moment in time. And then four seconds later, a follow-up email saying, "Ha, gotcha." <laughs> so yeah, was, yeah, that that was yeah. I will never forget that. Yeah, that would have. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I've. Um... I haven't experienced anything quite like that yet, so I'm, I'm glad I have it. Yeah, it was, you know, I was like, okay, okay, all right, all right, you know, but but of course, you know, but you know, prom did, you know, came a friend, and he was, you know, um, so like, we'll, we'll talk about one of his pieces here uh, somewhere online because I think yeah. I, I think I've got the nightmare in this in this batch of stuff. So what did uh, what was Boris and Julie's contribution to the foundation or the formation of what became the first IX Art Show? Uh, well, we uh, we did a uh, the very first exhibition that we did of any kind. Uh, we exhibited twenty six or twenty eight pieces from our collection at the Penn State Altoona uh, Gallery at the the Penn State Altoona Art Museum. You know, we we did a, we did an exhibit there. What year was this? Uh, this was in nineteen or uh, two thousand and or 2007 exactly when um but we did we did the exhibit there and you know artists who lived within five or six hours uh that we were exhibiting we let know hey if you want to come to the opening reception you know we're going to be exhibiting you know your pieces um matt stewart actually came uh Sweet. one of matt's paintings and matt matt came and he was there and, and uh, we'd invited boris and julie to come and I didn't know them really at the time, uh, but we had a, I had a Boris painting that we were exhibiting in the show. And so we did, invited you know, them to come because they lived in Allentown, which is about three and a half hours away. And they said, oh, we can't make it, you know, we're gonna be in the thing, but, but come out to our studio and visit with us. You know, so we did, uh, we were not courteous. So we, we, we made a, a, a schedule, we drove out, we, we made a, played a weekend, we drove out and visited them and went up to the Frazetta Museum. Um, and, uh, so we were, while we were visiting Boris and Julie, um, and Dave Palumbo, you know, Julie's son came over as well. Sure. And so we kind of devolved into those two separate conversations that you get with the group where I was talking to Boris and Dave and Jeannie was on the couch talking to Julie. And I have no idea what Boris and Dave and I were talking about. I, I don't remember. Um, but Jeannie, uh, was talking to Julie about shows. Um, you know, and she was saying that, you know, there, there needs, you know, why, 
where, where, where can you go? The same question you just asked, you know, where can you go to see this art, to see, you know, I've been to, you know, Mark Sugg's house and Jane Frank's house. I mean, but where can you see it other than in the artist or someone that, that owns it? And Julie said, well, you know, we, we don't do shows anymore really because they're just, it's not fun. I mean, you're kind of like a, just sort of a, a caged attraction, you know, sitting there and signing things and it's just a headache and it's a hassle and it's, it's just not fun. And, uh, and Jeannie said, well, well, where's the, you know, isn't there a show that's just for the artists? It's just about the art. And Julie said, no, no, there isn't. There's nothing like that. You should make one. We'd come. <laughs> and uh, so when, when we left, the, the, you know, we left there, had them, we're driving up to the Frisetta Museum. Uh, Jeannie told me about this and said, well, you know, well, you know, hey, there should be a show. That would be, I mean, how hard can it be? Um, so we, we talked about it on our way to the Frazetta Museum and then on our way home the next day um, and uh, decided, okay, we, we, so I then went and I proceeded to uh, email uh, a bunch of the artists, people like Steve Hickman and Michael Whalen and Bob Eggleton and people that were friends and say, hey, if we did this, will you come? Because if you will come, other artists will come and if the artists come, the collectors will come and it'll be, it'll be a really cool thing. And a whole bunch of them said, yeah, sure, we'd do that. We'd come. That'd be fun. And so we kind of hunted around for venues and uh, found a, a venue in Altoona that worked. And we, we proceeded to announce and have the first IX show. Yeah, I don't think I made it to, until the third one. Mm -hmm. um, but the first one I went to was in that, uh, it's like in a rectangular building with a, with a second Yep. Uh, that's four. Where, was oh, that yeah. the first one? That's where all the that's where all all five of the Altoona shows were there. Okay. They were in that venue, and then we moved to the Allentown Art Museum, and then we moved to Goggle Works in Reading, where we are now. So Th those, I mean, they were great. I mean, they were they were small venues. It was you know compared to what you have today, but uh, I just remember you know it was it was overwhelming to see that much. Um, science fiction fantasy artwork in one place. And I know you had, you had like a small little gallery with some of your pieces in the front, uh, at least the, the show I went to, Yep. you yep. know, and, and again, you were, there were, uh, there were a few artists from, you know, out of the country. So people that I, I had never, you know, even thought that I'd have ever have the opportunity of meeting. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was, it was a phenomenal experience, but uh, did you run into any challenges those first, Couple of years that do you, oh, uh, they were unforeseen. Yeah. Well, endless numbers of, of logistical challenges. Um, you know, I mean, so there, there was, there was, you know, uh, it was, it was, it was much, it was more difficult than, than anticipated. Um, I mean, we, we didn't really run into any issues with, you know, any, any other issues with people or stuff. And everybody was, was really good and really cool and everybody was awesome and just had fun. Um, you know, the showcase randomly birthed itself uh basically by by ix3 um you know that that's one of the one of the things i think is one of the cooler things about the ix show now um and it was originally the first year a bunch of collectors that came brought artwork to sell and trade and they were you know swapping in hotel rooms and hallways and selling and doing the stuff and uh so we thought well you know it'd be really cool for people to get to see that stuff you know, um, so the next year, okay, well, we got this little, little extra space in the hotel and we said, Hey, collectors, you can have a table there and you can, you can do your swapping and selling there. And that way, everybody that comes to the show can see what it is that you're offering. So you're coming and you're bringing, you know, a batch of, of you know, Roy Crankles or you're bringing a bunch of, you know, people can see them, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to, you know, most of the people not getting to see them. And so we, we set that up. We had like 25 tables for collectors. And, and uh, we had two of the uh, two young artists um, ask, said, hey, can, can, we, can we have a table? I mean, is it just for collectors? But can, can, we, can we get a table to put our stuff? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Go right ahead. And so are you, are you charging anybody for this? Or were you just renting the room because exactly. you knew you wanted to kind of have that? uh that opportunity back at the hotel to keep people engaged i don't think we charged them anything the first year uh the hotel gave us the room because we were selling so many you know we were selling enough enough rooms that they just they just let us use them yeah. for the morning because it was just an afternoon or an evening or one evening and uh and the artists so they did it and it was cool and everybody really liked it 
And so the next year we said, hey, we're going to do this again. And instantaneously, all of the tables got taken by artists. Um, and a collector never again <laughs> exhibited. <laughs> um, it became the, the artist showcase um, and, and grew and expanded from there. Right. So for those of you who don't know, although we've talked about it quite a bit, you know, there's a main show that's part of IX. And now, uh, since that point in time, there's a, a showcase that happens afterward in the evenings, Friday and Saturday. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's usually from what, like eight to midnight or something, but it's a totally separate event where another 120 artists i think are typically set up in that uh that facility as well but it's back at the hotel so it's really nice you go to the main show today it's at the gaga works which is a, a wonderful facility for this uh four floors of uh, of art to look at but when you get uh get done for the evening and you go back to the hotel and after you have dinner you end up being able to go to another show on friday and saturday evening full of uh equally talented artists that weren't juried into the main show, which happens over at the Goggle Works. So it's a, uh, so it, it, you're, it, it's a very immersive experience for those uh, you know interested in this because it's it's nonstop, uh, just you know, engagement with other collectors and with uh, with the artists themselves. And it's again, it's a, it's an incredibly unique experience because uh, you, you just never stop talking about art. Or meet, you know, making meeting new friends, right? I mean, I, I I've I've always overwhelmed when I go there, so uh, you know, it's it's just a wonderful experience. So we don't really have anything necessarily exactly comparable to that in in uh, comic art, but you know, there's there's a few things. What Morgan's been doing in Como's, uh, I think, you know, kind of a similar vein, a little bit different, but but what Pat and Jeannie have come up with is just it's just the perfect experience. At the end of the day, I mean, it's. Uh, it's hands down, you know, the 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 de facto go to show if you're an art collector or an artist. Thank you. Um, but yeah, it's it's so you know, but the, the the main structure of the show's been the same uh, basically ever since there was a showcase. It's you know based around collectors and artists and students. Um, you know, we have originally we had collectors and artists and students, and that was basically it. We, we didn't have any like general public coming to the shows at all in the early years. Um, you know, now we actually get more people coming in on the weekend mm -hmm. uh, you know, who are just who are fans or just who are, you know, enthusiasts, although a lot of collectors come in then too. Um, you know, so yeah, yeah, Tim, yeah, Tim buys as much from the showcase as the main show. And it's like, yeah, there's a lot of stuff. Um, you know, it, it's it's huge things. You've got early, you know, uh, you've got everything from you know, emerging artists. Um, up to major artists who, for one reason or another, can't do the main show that year. Um, you know, who, who are busy and, you know, can't do the main show that year. Um, and so they, they, cause the showcase is only two nights, whereas the main show, you got to be there for five days. Uh, these are, you know, picks from, from various spots in the main show. Correct. And it, it really is an art exhibition. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's not it's it's not your standard uh, convention fair that, you know, we're so so accustomed to. I mean, this really it feels like uh, you're walking into a gallery at the end of the day. And I think that that's the way you guys have treated it, you know, letting the artists know that, you know, you're really need to present things in, in the best way. I mean, you know, probably don't even have to say it. People just understood. You know, so when you walk in there, you see the pieces here uh, and this is on David Wetzel's uh, uh, Wenzel's uh, wall, just everything's, you know, many pieces are wonderfully framed. I mean, everything's presented well. You, you walk in and, it, you know, it's just so impressive. And it's booth after booth of, of uh, these sorts of setups. And in, in Goggle Works, it's a unique layout in general because of the, just the, the uh, size of the place. But, you know, it's it, most spaces that people have to set up their, their artwork isn't like a standard, like, 10 by 8 foot booth. You know, they've usually got a 15 foot wall. Uh, you know, and, and, and a kind of an interesting spot within the building or ones that, uh, you know, like, like here, Rob Bray's, uh, love his stuff. He's, he was a cover artist on IBA, uh, early on. So, uh, it, it just, it's, it's just a fun, unique space. You're just, and, 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 uh, you know, I can't stress enough how, how enjoyable it is. So, um, let me just kind of switch through a few more of these, but these are, these are in the main show, like, like. You want to tell them a little bit about the Gaga Works and how and what it's used for today? Oh, the Gaga Works is awesome. Uh, the Gaga Works is literally one of my favorite places in the world. 
Um, it is. It was an old uh, safety goggle manufacturing plant uh, that then moved into developing other safety sort of things and gas masks during the war and, and so on and so forth. Um, and the factory closed down, I believe, in the 80s. Mm -hmm. um, and it was you know, right in downtown Reading. It's a city block, basically, in size. And uh, in the... You know, in the late 90s, I guess, or thereabouts, or early aughts, uh, they had the idea, of, there were several of the, you know, kind of the, the Reading boosters uh, had the idea of taking this factory and converting it into a community arts center, um, which they did. And that's why it's called the Goggle Works, because it was, in fact, a safety goggle manufacturing plant. But it is a 144,000 square foot venue. Um, and so it has five floors, you know, the first floor is all galleries. The second floor has offices and galleries and, and meeting spaces, which is where, and, and exhibition spaces, which is where we, which is where these photos, for example, uh, with the pro panels, they're on the second floor and the fourth floor mm -hmm. and they're big spaces. The third and fourth floors, I think are all, uh, artist studios, you know, that's all, it's just full of artist studios. The fifth floor is offices. Uh, a lot of community arts and local artists and stuff. Like we have, a, we have an office um, on the fifth floor uh, at Goggle Works, and then they've got you know a glass studio and they do classrooms and it, it's an amazing, it's just an amazing venue. Um, you know they've kept a lot of the of the original floors and a lot of the original features like the safes and the, the are all there. You know it's, it's it's really it's just a fabulous place. Um, and it, it's got a great vibe to it. Um, you know, for, for some reason, uh, the people that work at the goggle works are like the coolest people ever, like kind of a, they're just, they're just universally awesome. Um, you know, and they, they love the show. Uh, a lot of them, it's like Christmas for them. It's their favorite time of the year is when IX comes, um, you know. And, uh, you know, so, so that's where, that's where the, the current venue is because it, it, uh, it just works really well. It gives us enough space to have, because one of the things about the main show is we provide wall space because there's no point in having an art show without wall space. So we provide panels, walls, whatever for the artists to hang their work. Well, that's a lot of, a lot of wall space and then a lot of floor space because they also have tables. Right. And so it's, there aren't a lot of places where you can have that combination. And Great. Goggle, so did you have to buy those for the, for, for you know, I know they, they were an art center anyway, but it, were there things that you had to kind of purchase to, just specifically to put on the show here? The panels, uh, we negotiated our original contract with Goggle Works uh, that is part of the contract. They would buy the 200 or whatever panels I figured out that we needed, um, which they own. Um, and they use them for your community arts fest. They will use them for other things. Um, uh, the only thing that we had to do there is the second floor and the fourth floor has uh, overhead hanging big fluorescent lights, um, which are not great for art. They've got wonderful light from windows, but not great for art. But it turned out that they have, you can see up in there, there's, an, there's a track lighting system up there. Right. Old track lighting system. Well, the, an old track lighting system, they no longer make any of the stuff for that. Um, but we were able to work with the building manager uh, to get a new track lighting system and have him tie it into the old tracks, just make rat tails to tie into the old tracks. Um, and just, you know, just basically, you know, like, uh, you know, just, just clip the new tracks up to the old tracks. And so we went and bought a lighting grid um, and it lives at Goggle Works, but we own the actual lighting grid uh, that goes up in the second floor and the fourth floor every year. Nice. I saw Tim Frederick mentioned that uh, Dave Seeley always has uh, the best photo album. If anyone wants to see that, what the show is like, these photos are from Dave, by the way, I, I didn't uh, get the chance to mention. That. I was trying to find my own photos from uh, the last show I went to, which I think was 2019. And I don't know where the heck I put them. Like I said, the photograph of you that was, and Jeannie that I was looking for, I yeah. can't find. I have, I've got too many external hard drives. I have no idea which one has all those photos on it. So I had to dive over to Dave's uh, 
his his Facebook page and scam a few uh, photos off him. But Dave Seeley does whenever he goes anywhere. He he is definitely the guy taking the most photographs. Oh yes, yes. We we, I, we, we actually we, we we have had we've had a year or two where we've hired a photographer, mm -hmm. um, and then we concluded that Dave Seeley did a better job just <laughs> himself than the photographer that we hired to shoot things. Um, so we, we just, we, we rely on, we rely on Dave's photos, uh, fairly extensively because Dave comes every year. Uh, right. you know, I mean, Davis has never missed an IX, um, you know, and so therefore he, you know, we, we, we have good photos every year. Yeah, no, he does a fantastic job. I've, I've always admired, he, he's got a great eye and that's, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. But I mean, we could go through all, I mean, there's just so many, I mean, and this is all, this is just from you know this last year in 2022 in october it's always like what the third weekend in october or am i yeah, is, yeah it, it's it's the, the first day of the show is anywhere between october 17th or 18th and the you know 23rd or 20 20th depending on the year but it's right in that kind of time it's before right before halloween mm -hmm. That's right. the weekend before halloween is usually uh when the show ends up being and it's a five-day show yep uh, I usually make it only for four. That's why I was I didn't yeah. want to commit. But yes, yeah, okay. It starts on a Wednesday and goes yeah. through Sunday. Yep, yeah, Wednesday the show opens for the evening preview from six to nine p.m. and then it runs ten to five on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, and the showcase is from eight to midnight on Friday and Saturday. So those two days, it's you know the, the, you get the full. You go to the show and then you go and eat and then you go to the showcase. And if you're the artist in the showcase at the show, then you go and you drink. Um, and you get the, so the, the main, the, sh the main show is kind of like, a uh, we, we, we try to refer as kind of, it's kind of like a five day gallery opening. Right. Um, and then the showcase is more like a cocktail party with art. Um, you know, there's, there's kind of a different vibe in the two and that's deliberate because it just makes it fun. Oh yeah. No, there's a cash bar or a couple cash bars at the uh, showcase, which we don't get at the, the main show. And, uh, it does. <laughs> But you now actually now you do actually because Goggleworks has a liquor license now. Ah, um, so yeah, I missed out on. That. Yep. So you actually can get nice beer and wine and drink. You can get drinks and stuff during the main show at, at Goggleworks now too. Oh yeah, yeah. You, you, if you want to, if you want to attract artists, the more booze you have, the easier it is to attract artists. <laughs> well, and collectors too. Collectors, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. We've actually we've actually warned the collectors. Um, you know about the uh, you know the 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 hazards of, of shopping for art while inebriated, um, <laughs> right? And just so everybody knows, this is a this is the showcase. So the other you know, Gaga Works is the older factory setting, and uh, this is the uh, showcase back at the hotel. And, and what is it like, twelve thousand square feet? I mean, it's a pretty large room. Yeah, that's the, the ballroom's twelve thousand square feet. Yeah, and it's a perfect size. And again, you have one hundred twenty six artists in that space. Mm -hmm. around there i don't know how i say why i keep saying 126 but that's the number that sticks in my well, head it, it varies slightly depending on, but but typically it's between 120 and 130. there so you go 130 is the most we can and we can cram into the space um and they all have six foot tables um and for there you know we don't provide them with panels and stuff because logistically it's just not feasible yeah but the artists will bring their own and set them up um, you know, so you still end up with, with all of that stuff. Let's see. And, I guess that's the last image I had from the showcase, but, uh, Carly Milligan right there. She did the cover to the last, uh, infected by art. So, yep. Yep. um, but yeah, no. So it's, uh, as everybody can see, it's just, it's a really unique show. And, you know, if you're a fan of, uh, the, uh, fantastic arts in any way, uh, this is definitely the place to go. And it's all traditional too. I mean, that's, uh, should be pointed out, even though everybody knows like in the, in the book that we put together in fact, by art, there are non-traditional painting in there as well. But, uh, but Patrick and Jeannie, you know, th their focus, you know, s solely is on traditional painting and keeping well, that being, and, or tradition, the traditional art form and keeping that alive, you know, and so that while, while many of these artists probably do have a, a digital, piece here or there. I mean, the, the bent and the focus of your mission, I think, is to keep keep artists traditional, keep them working traditional. I mean, I, I know early on, and I, it was something I was going to ask you about be, uh, as well. I know that one of the things that IX did every year was you did a did uh, four, anywhere, anywhere between three and five major commissions with artists the year before. 
and those pieces were kind of the featured pieces uh, of the show. I don't know if that's something that you continue as much as you did early on, but I always thought that that was a great thing that you guys did because it gave an artist the opportunity to paint something at a scale uh, that they might not ever normally have the opportunity to do. And also to, you know, you were paying them to do something that they, again, would not necessarily take the time to do outside of their uh, regular work schedule. So I really felt that that was a great mission to be on, to, you know, to keep artists focused on sort those sorts of things and to give them the opportunity to create major works of art. We still, we still do that. We do commissions every year. Um, you know, the, the number varies, you know, we don't necessarily do, you know, four or five, or, you know, of the many of every year, but, but we do do the commissions every year. And that was the point. It was, you know, most of the time, sometimes we'll get, you know, we'll say, Hey, artist, you're awesome at this and you love to paint this. So how about you do a giant painting of, you know, Patrick Jones, you like the, the what you like most in the world is painting Conan and painting beautiful women. So how about a giant painting of Conan and beautiful women? Um, right. But in a lot of them, we just give the artist carte blanche. Uh, we agree on a size and a price and they go, paint whatever they want um and uh you know and and usually they are spectacular um you know when you take these kind of artists and you give them the opportunity to do anything they want uh you know you, you they will come up with some fairly amazing stuff i agree and we're going to see some of those uh when we get into showing off the 18 pieces that you've selected too yeah, I, uh, I, I did with the 18 pieces i, I focused more on uh, stuff from our collection that aren't IX pieces because the IX pieces get shown a lot. Right. Um, but the things that we own don't get shown nearly as much because they're not, we can't use them for the show. Um, so we can't use those for PR and that. So they don't get shown very much. Uh, but I do have some of the, some of my favorites of the IX commissions, uh, you know, are in that batch. Now, I I, I've been to your house, but I've not been in your house. Remember, I dropped off those Iva books a few years ago. Right. I mean, from the from the street, your house does not look that big. So I don't know where you're putting all this art. Two thousand square feet. Okay. Um, <laughs> it is it is hung everywhere, um, and and we have and there is a an extra room upstairs that is basically storage. Mm -hmm. uh, you know where it's it, where we store the things and we rotate. Um, just because so many of the IX commissions are big, um, you know, you, you have limited, you know, amounts of, of, of those you can put up at once. So we kind of, we'll put one up for a while and then we'll take it down and we'll put something else up and then we'll, you know, they, they kind of get moved around. Uh, there are some pieces like this piece, this Chris Reimers behind me doesn't move, uh, because it's six foot by six foot. And this is literally the only place in the house we can put it. Um, it won't fit upstairs. Um, our stairs are too narrow and steep because the house was a 1947 house. So it, it lives here and will live here on the, the entry room wall forever um, because it won't go anywhere else. Was that a commission though? Or was yeah. that? This was not a commission. This was a piece that we, we showed up at the show uh, in the first year that Chris came. Uh, he brought these amazing, gigantic pieces. He was a student of Tanaya Sims's. Right. And, uh, he came and was like, oh my God, that's amazing. And everybody loved it. It was like, oh, I can't get that home. I can't. And Chris said, well, I can drop it all. You know. And I looked at Gia, I told you, I said, you know, Jeannie, um, we, we have, we have a U-Haul. We, <laughs> so we actually had a truck. We had a U-Haul truck at the show that year. Like, we have a truck, you know, we, we could totally get that home in the truck. We, we, we have a big enough truck, to take it home. Uh, so we bought it and brought it home. You know, if we hadn't had the truck, it probably, you probably wouldn't have, but since we had the truck and it's, it's amazing. It's great. It's one of our favorite pieces and it looks really great when you come in. I use it as a backdrop for typically when I do these sorts of things. Exactly. Uh, it looks cool. Yeah. We have uh, a dealer that likes to call certain commissions wall power. And so that's why Mikhail just mentioned that you're, you're redefining the term <laughs> wall power. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it really is. I mean, for us, wall power, you know, when it's a comic art commission, maybe it's uh 24 by 36, right? I mean, cause that, that, that's a big illustration, you know, oh, yeah. So uh, when you see something that's six foot by six foot, yeah, that's pretty spectacular. Stanley says that you need a mansion. I do. I, I agree. We, we very much need a mansion. Um, we had actually talked. We, we spent a number of years debating about moving um, to a bigger house. So we had more wall space. Mm -hmm. uh, but we eventually concluded that there's just two of us and we don't need more room other than the wall space. And it was asinine to spend the amount of money we would have had to spend to buy a bigger house just to have more wall space. 
Right. Um, it just, it just, it, it just. Well, you buy a bigger house, you won't be able to buy as much artwork. So you got It's a, it's a healthy balance that you yeah. have to achieve. Yeah, exactly. You yeah. got to work. You got to, got to, got to kind of work around it, uh, and sort of manage it. So we, we, what we did instead is actually we sold a lot of art, um, and 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 put all the money into remodeling this house mm -hmm. to be the way we want, um, which actually worked well. It scaled our numbers down a little bit. Scaled down. We still have about 120 pieces. I mean, but it. We, you know, we, we were able to offset some of the annual increase, um, you know, that way. And, and so it, it's actually worked out pretty well. It definitely seems that way. Well, um, why don't we, uh, well, so, so I guess, you know, general question before we move on to the art, I mean, are, are there any uh, changes to the IX format that you foresee in the future? Things that you want to do differently with it than you've, uh, you know, because you've been at Goggle Works now for, for a, what, five years or maybe six since 2016, 16, 2016. Was All right. Um, and you missed one show during COVID, right? So, um, you know, I mean, so you seem pretty, pretty settled and set in the format and the way things are. I mean, but is there anything that you wish you, you know, they'd like to be able to do with it that right now you haven't really gotten to achieve with it? Um, you know, it's, it's honest, it's, it's just kind of coming up with ways to sort of make it incrementally cooler. Um, you know, whenever we can, uh, we'd like to try to get a little more involvement from the community. Um, we try to try to work in, in various ways and such that we can do that and kind of things that we can bring in. Um, we, we love the venue. I mean, there just there isn't a better venue. Um, you know, when we when we left the Allentown Art Museum, we searched five states. Uh, we looked in Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Delaware and Maryland um, for venues. And the Goggle Works was by far the best venue because we didn't want to do it in a convention center, mm -hmm. um, you know. And so there, I mean, it, it's literally the Goggle Works is the largest community art center in the U.S. in terms of square footage, um, you know. And so it's just like, yeah, it just happened to be. That's it. That's 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 the spot, you know. Um, and I remember we went to we went to look at it. Uh, I I found them online and we were searching and I sent sent them an email. To say, hey, you know, we have this art show and this thing, and we, I don't know, would you be interested maybe in talking about, you know, the thing? And uh, I sent the email in, and I got it, and then I about 15, 20 minutes later, um, I got an email back saying that the director of the the director of the venue would like to speak with you. Can we schedule a call? Um, and so we we talked to the director, and he was super gung ho. Uh, bringing in shows like IX is something that he wanted for the Goggle Works. Mm -hmm. He was ecstatic, so they they brought us out there and gave us the red carpet tour of Reading and and uh, showed us the venue. And we loved it, and we said the only problem is that the only hotel within walking distance of the of the, of the Goggle Works is this old Abraham Lincoln Hotel, which is great. Presidents have stayed there, you know, but it it, it holds like sixty people, you know, and that's the only thing within walking distance. Everything else is on this side of the bridge. And they said, "Oh, they're they're building a double tree. They're 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 building a double tree right right there. It's gonna it'll it'll be ready by 16. Um, you know, so we actually contracted with the double tree when it was a hole in the ground. Um, you know, we just had you know artist drawings of what it was going to look like, but we actually signed the contract with them before it was even built. Um, you know, so it just happened to work out time wise, and so we." Don't have any particular enthusiasm to go anywhere other than other than there because it's everything is great. You've already got the best spot on the East Coast. Yeah, I mean, there's you know, there's you know, I mean, in terms of of just sort of all the balance of all the things, it's like yeah, it's just it, it's that's that's where it works. Um, dealers and collectors uh, selling at the show, uh, they do themselves off the books. Uh, we do not uh, give space. Well. We will give. We will allow uh, people to buy uh, showcase tables if they want. Um, and the showcase is open to whatever. The showcase is, you know, it can be. We, we do allow digital art in the showcase. Mm -hmm. um, it's not because it's not juried, and it's we, we. That's that's flexible. The main show, we only allow artists. We don't allow any dealers. We don't allow any, any you know, anything. It's you know, collector. It's all. It's just you know, ninety artists uh, that are juried into that show. Roughly. Right. And there are art reps that go there. I mean, Tatiana goes, Mark, uh, oh, the show, and I'm sure you can totally buy stuff from them there, but we don't, they don't actually, yeah. 
Right. right, right, exactly. And that's, and we're used to that in our, you know, world as well. There's some dealers that just show up with a portfolio, right? Because <laughs> again, oh, yeah. Like yeah. You're, yeah, I mean, and that's, uh, that, that's commonplace. And in a weird way, I'd rather they do that, you know, at a show like yours, because you want more artists there. So I'd rather the dealer just sit down at the bar or in a corner, uh, you know, meeting spot and maybe show off a few things that they bring. And we also, we also do it that way specifically because the artists, um, because unlike most of the shows or, or a lot of the show, you know, we don't, uh, we don't have any guests of honor. Uh, you know, we don't pay for any of the artists to come to the show. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't pay them to be there. We don't pay their expenses. They pay for their tables and they, they foot all their bills, even the ones coming from overseas. Um, and so we want them to sell. We want them to sell as much as possible. And so we don't want them competing with dealers. Right. Uh, at the event. And so that's the, that's the main reason why we don't allow dealers and stuff at the show is because, well, then they're competing with the artists. Yes. Jerry always has. Yeah. Jerry, of course, always brings a uh, huge amount. And I mean, other people do too, you know, but at least they're not directly competing, you know, um, you know, with, with the artists. Right. Well, you got to get the, uh, the artists have to sell or they're not going to come back. And, and like you said, it's because, yeah. Uh, it, you know, first it's an honor to get juried into the main show, but yeah, then you still have to pay for your space. So that, I mean, we didn't talk about that, but that is how the, the, the structure of the show, it really makes it, you know, the artists want to be there. It's, right. it's a show that, that, uh, they want to be a part of. And, uh, Patrick's done a fantastic job cultivating a, a great base of collectors that make the trip, uh, right. you know, every year to, uh, to, to the show. I yeah, mean, it makes it, it makes it amazing. Uh, you know, but it means that, you know, the decisions, any decisions that we make about the show are always predicate. Well, first and foremost, it's got to be as it's got to be the best we can make it for the artists that are exhibiting it. Mm -hmm. That's the primary number one. That's the first thing we have to do. Everything else is secondary, um, you know, because we don't pay people to be there. Um, we decided early on that we just were not going to do that because we we hoped even early that the show would be you know, a who's who, you know, and how do you say, okay, well, Michael Whalen is a guest of honor, but Boris Vallejo is not. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can't, can't do that. You know, so, so we thought, no, we're going to do it as everybody's equal. Everybody's the same. Everybody is, there's no difference. Everybody submits to the jury. Uh, no one, the only artists and whoever not, whoever don't have to submit to the jury are the commissioned artists. For the next year because obviously if they're doing a commission for the show they need to be there you know right. um but otherwise you know boris and julie submit to the jury every year um you know donato submits to the jury every year uh when they come you know michael whalen and greg hill they submit their work to the jury and they get jury mm -hmm. uh, you know because it you know that that's the way it you know that that's what makes it fair exactly well, uh, why don't we look at some of the work here? Because uh, you know some of the things that you've commissioned are in this set, and then I'll, there's a lot of pieces that are not. So uh, let me see here. I've got everything queued up in the order that I got them from you. So oh. here we go to start. All right. Well, this piece and the next piece, if they're in order, they are, uh, are both pieces by an artist named Richard Bober, uh, who is not well known. Uh, to anybody outside of the relative cognoscenti of fantasy and science fiction art collecting. Um, uh, but he was a genius. Uh, mad as a hatter, um, but a genius. Uh, just absolutely one of the finest painters that's ever worked in this genre. Uh, he passed away last year, uh, sadly. Um, but uh, he was... When I, back in 1995, we were talking about early on, uh, you know, Jane Frank had her first printed catalog. Um, and in this printed catalog, she repped Richard Bober. And this was, um, you know, and she had uh, two of the series. This is, this is from a three book series. Uh, and she had, uh, this piece was not in, in there, but the other two pieces were in there. And they were the most amazing things I'd ever seen. Uh, I just, I, I just was mesmerized and they were, 
like $8,500 or so, uh, which might as well have been $12 million at that point. I mean, I, I was buying in the like 800 range, uh, you know, uh, so I couldn't afford them, um, you know, but but I always wanted Bobers and over the years I would get Bobers and I would have nice Bobers, uh, but they weren't the, the finest Bobers, but they were not in several different ones. They threw the thing and always loved the stuff and talked with Jane and we did a show of Bober and he was supposed to come to IX one year, but then he backed out because he's a recluse to want to be, you know, seeing people, um, you know, and then last year, um, the fourth book, which I did not include here, uh, uh, came back to Jane on a resale, um, which is, that was for a cover that it, the book got canceled. So Richard finished the painting, but it's not done to anywhere near the level of the other three. Um, but it's still really nice. It's called Cave of the Golden Dragon. It is in my calf. And uh, so we, uh, you know, so I bought it. And then talking to Jane about it, she says, you know, well, you know, I, I do know who owns, you know, Crystals of Air and Water. Um, I could see if they would be interested in selling. And uh, I said, okay. And uh, amazingly enough, they were actually willing to sell Crystals of Air and Water. Um, so we, we bought it. Um, and then after that, uh, the previous one, the, the, uh, storyteller and Jan, that first piece, Jane Franco's, um, and that piece hung in the entryway, entry hallway of her house it was the second painting you saw when you walked into her house. Um, and of course, always just stunned by that painting and loved it and amazing. And, and uh, she had downsized and she, uh, I said, hey, Jane, would you, you know, you were willing to sell it at one point and then you changed, you know, would, would you, would you sell that one? And uh, she decided that she would. And so we, we were able to acquire uh, the Cave of the Jan as well. Uh, so it kind of completes this nearly 30 year odyssey of, of wanting these specific paintings. Uh, unfortunately, the last one is in the hands of collector friends of ours who have no intention of selling it. Um, so we probably will have to be content with just three instead of all four of them. Right. They are all, they are, uh, 23 by 37. Uh, it's all of the, they're all the same size. They're all 20, the Bobers are 23 by 37. They must be spectacular. Now, uh, framed, I assume. Oh yes. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so. yeah. The cave of the golden dragon is upstairs right now. Um, the other two are, are, right across or in the corner of the room, right across from me here in, uh, here in kind of the front, the front room. Wow. Three, three out of four is good. We, we, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm never expected I'd have three out of the four. Exactly. So no, that's not too bad. Not too bad at all. And, uh, it's funny. I'm actually going to have Jane on, uh, the show settled on a date. I'm not even, it's mid mid May or late May or something like that. I find I bought my first piece of art from her uh, oh. at, at the beginning of the year, and it, it already had some water damage on it, so I knew it was going to, you know, ha have some issues when I got it. Uh, and then it arrived really damaged; so it was like folded and everything. It was, uh, it was a bit beat up. I just got it back from restoration, but uh, but Jane and I had a great, you know, email exchange about it. Uh, she was really great to deal with, um, you know, with with what had happened and. And I, you know, I was like, well, this is just a, another opportunity for me. I've never had to take something to be restored before. So, you know, for me, it was a great learning experience at, at, on top of that. But Jane was, she was great. And so in, in emailing with her, I said, yeah, I got to have you on. And, and, but now this is giving me some ideas. I should see if she has any photographs of the the home, you know, before, uh, you know, the, the, uh, before she sold a lot of the collection and moved and everything, because that's one of the topics that she wanted to talk about was, uh, going through the process of downsizing one's collection as you kind of retire out of the hobby, you know, the, uh, you know, and that's, that was something that was really important. And on all the little bullet points I talked about that I'd like to talk to her about, that was like her number one thing. She's like, I want to talk about that. I want to talk about, you know, when, when you get to, get to an age, you can't own it all anymore. There's, there's two books um, of their collection. Uh, if, you know, they, they published, Piper Tigers published two books okay. of their collection. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm sure that she's got photos of lots that. of photos. Well, I'm, I'm going to pick those up because I've, I've heard about them, but uh, but I, I'm going to make a note of that too. It's, I it's never. Amazing, 
you know, I mean, it was just, it was just, it was, it was like being, there's, I've only ever been in one other, well, no, two other houses that were like that. Um, I, I, I was, was privileged enough to be in Richard Kelly's house. Oh, wow. Which is the Kelly collection of American illustration. Um, and, uh, so, you know, this, this, oh, oh, look, there's this, there's the hall of Wyatt's and piles. <laughs> and full yeah, of, a... and pile. You know, um, kind of just, uh, you know, and then uh, I was also privileged. They were, they were nice enough to do a webinar for us, but to visit uh, the, the Fred Ross collection, mm-hmm. uh, to visit their home, uh, which they, they had difficulty getting me out of, of, of their house. Uh, it, it, Cause I, they, yeah, I mean, they, there was everybody was talking in the foyer as we were leaving, and I kind of just wandered back into the living room uh, <laughs> to, to stand in front of an Edmund Layton painting uh, called Box Populi. Uh, if you ever get a chance to look it up, it's it's six feet high or so, um, and I just Jeannie had to come and, and get me and get by the arm take. <laughs> He gets like this, everyone, when he yeah stands in front of the audience. That's the that's the that's the the non fantasy science fiction. That's that's you know nineteenth uh, or early twentieth century realist painting. So that's where you they've got Almatetimas and Bougaros and Mukas and mm-hmm. and you know they have all of this you know um, amazing stunning stuff. But Jane's house was that for fantasy and science fiction. Um, so. So uh, T.J. James wanted to know uh, were the Bobers oil? Oh, they are. Yes, they are oils. Yeah. Um, and exactly. they are very heavily glazed. Um, you know, Bober is that's that's kind of his one of his things, and they 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 they, they light in person differently than they do in reproduction. They look good in reproduction, um, but they don't they don't uh, compare. Um, but there's a very limited number of, of top tier Bobers. Um, you know, he spent the seventies, he did kind of a still magnificent style, but not quite the ornate thing that he did later. Did mm-hmm. a lot of Robert Hitchcock covers, uh, and stuff in the seventies. Then he started doing this really ornate, staggeringly good stuff. Uh, but he was super slow and he could never make a deadline. Um, so publishers stopped using him, um, because he, he could never make a deadline because he was never finished. Um, and then he developed terrible arthritis in his hands um, and wasn't able, was still good, but wasn't able to paint the same way. Mm-hmm. Um, so basically you've got early 80s through early 90s um, is pretty much the, the peak of, of, of Bober and there just aren't that many pieces. That's unfortunate. It's terrible. Uh, if, he, if he had been more prolific... He would have been a legend if he had been more prolific. Um, he just yeah, it's too bad you couldn't have gotten gotten him to that show. You know, that's yeah. One of, right. one of my great regrets is, I mean, I, I I did a partial book on Bober. I mean, we did twenty pages on him and Visions of Never, mm-hmm. uh, and I literally never got to speak to the man. I had to interview him via fax through Jane. Wow. Um, you know, I never got to meet him. Never got to speak to him. Um, and so one of, one of my greatest regrets is that I never got to, you know, but I tried, I did the best I could. He's just, he was a recluse and he just didn't, didn't want to, you know, yeah. didn't want to interact with people. Oh man. Well, that's, uh, that's very unfortunate, but, uh, let's see next. I want to take a look at the next piece here. This one is from bad, uh, Brad Kunkel. Yes. Uh, this is a, uh, a, Non-illustrator. We've got some some non illustrator you know, Brad is uh, he he grew up and kind of went to school and was friends with people like Donato and Dorian Vallejo and and those folks. But he he went into the gallery market um, and he is a hugely successful gallery painter. He's represented by Arcadia. Um, and if you ever want to see some really amazing figurative art, go look at Arcadia Gallery. Um, they have some of the they work with some of the finest. And Brad is one of the people that they work with. Um, and he does these amazing imaginative pieces with silver leafing and and this delicate gold and and deli- it, they're just they're absolutely stunning and beautiful. Um, and uh, you know we actually we commissioned this piece from Brad. Um, you know we we talked to him on you know uh, and he he did this for us. This is this is a thirty by forty, which is 
not the biggest uh, kunkels, but a good sized kunkel. Um, and, uh, you know, so, and this is, uh, it's called Arak. And, uh, if you look, you probably can't see here, but if you look all through the, uh, all through the, 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 the branches are carved names for dragon in different languages. <laughs> so that's, you know, um, and you may have seen his stuff if you watched the, uh, the, the recent, um, Anne of Green Gables mm -hmm. series. He did the artwork in the opening credits. Um, all of that stuff that that's all Kunkel's work. Oh, I didn't know that. That's that's so, pretty cool. But uh, yeah, his stuff is just fabulous. This is one of our the, one of our favorite things that we own. Was uh, this a was this an IX commission or one that you just uh, did on your own? This was because uh, Brad's never come to the show. That's um, what I thought. Yeah, but Brad's an example of one of those people that because he has nowhere to sell, um, he sits and he spends a year and a half painting. And then he has the gallery show and it immediately sells out. And then he goes and spends another year and a half painting. Um, so there's no incentive for anyone like to come to it because he has nothing to sell. Right. It doesn't have any arts and it's gone. He, you know, Brad's He's always painting for the next uh, gallery show. Wow. The next show, um, you know, and uh, you know, so yeah, I'd love to have him, you know, I'd love to be, but he just, there's not, he's not ever going to have any work, <laughs> you know, to, to bring to the show. Um, you know, so, but the, yeah, that's, that's, that's the, the thing with this piece. Um, and we just, we just, you know, absolutely, absolutely love it. It's an example of the, you know, I, I think this might be the only one I actually, well, no, I think I have the Dorian in here too. Uh, but we have some things like this and Luke Hillestot and Jeremy Mann um, and some people that are, that are more mainstream figurative. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have Michael Parks, uh, we have Steve Hanks. Um, so we do like some of those things that kind of have that imaginative feel to them, even though they're not technically right. uh, things. And this is, this is one of them. Well, this next piece is uh, pretty beautiful by Roger Dean. It's uh, identifiable. This is, a, this is also a commission. Yeah. Um, that that uh, Roger did a great story behind this one. Um, we, we Roger came to IX uh, back in 2013, I think. Um, and so we got to know him, we got to talk to him, and he's a real nice guy. And uh, we we wanted to know if you do a commission for us, because uh, a, a, we couldn't afford any of his stuff. <laughs> so we wanted to know if you would do a commission that we could we could work out something that we we could afford. And uh, he he agreed in this. He said, "Well, he said, look, he said because I, I he had this he had done this piece called Land's End, which is a very famous painting of his, and uh, I loved it." And he said, well, tell you what, so I did, he said, you know, I did a sequel to that painting called Land's End 2. And I sold it to a collector um, and I created it up and I shipped it to him at his office where he wanted it shipped to his workplace. And the painting arrived, the crate arrived on a day when he wasn't there. And so it was put in his office and somehow someone decided that the crate was empty and they threw it out. <laughs> and so the collective where they were, oh, we threw that crate away. What? And the painting was in it uh, and it was destroyed. And so Roger said, that, well, that since the sequel that I did got destroyed and no longer exists, I'm willing to paint another sequel. So that's why this is called Land's End 3. Um, yeah, you know, although Land's End Two is is no longer for this world. It's in the wow. landfill somewhere. That's unfortunate. Wow. Yeah, it's, somebody got fired that next day. <laughs> uh, so yes, um, but yeah, it's it's twenty by thirty. Um, it's uh, acrylic on hardboard. Um, I mean, the, the, the year that we got it, uh, we we decided uh, we didn't we didn't put up a Christmas tree that year. We took this painting and put it up on an easel and wrapped lights around the easel put presents underneath the easel and called it our Christmas team. Um, Very appropriate. Yes. Yeah, so that, that was our, that was, that was our Christmas tree uh, uh, one year. <laughs> oh man. Well, that is a tragic story though. Uh, you know, I, I honestly, I always check the, uh, the packaging of mm -hmm. you know, for anything I get when I'm throwing it out because I have this uh, a fear that Ooh. I'm going to throw out a piece of art, even though I, you know, I know I've taken it out. It's like, I just, I know it one day, the one day I don't look, there's going to be something in there. I forgot about. Yep. Always, always got to check. I mean, I, it's, yeah, it's absolutely, you know, and, and uh, 
You know, I have to, I do it I do it more because now I get um, way, way, way more art for other people mm. and for myself. Um, so I've had, you know, my, just, just full of boxes, you know, of art for, that I'm gathering and then having craters and freighters come and do big crates to send overseas mm. because it's way cheaper to do it in a bulk shipment than it is to individually send all these pieces to Hong Kong or send them to Singapore or send them to, you know, right. You know, wherever else. And so I have to be, I end up just leaving them in the boxes until we're ready for craters. And then I go through and I open them all and check and do, do it all at once and have them all stacked so that they're, you know, so I can kind of review everything and make sure everything is, 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 is good and set so that there's the least likelihood that I somehow manage to lose or damage a painting that someone else has paid a whole bunch of money for. Smart move. <laughs> That's cool. Now, uh, here's one of my favorite pieces in your calf, but uh, this Ian McKaig, uh, the proposal piece, just lovely. Absolutely lovely. I've always loved uh, Ian's work, but uh, this, this one in particular is stunning. Ian is, uh, at this point, Ian McKaig watercolors are really close to unobtainium. Um, they just, they don't turn up. Ian quit painting in early 90s. Um, you know, when he started working in Hollywood, um, he went digital and he stopped painting in watercolors and he doesn't paint in watercolors anymore. Um, and uh, so he didn't actually do that much in watercolor, uh, but he's brilliant. He's, I mean, he is absolute every bit the equal of Alan Lee and John Howe and Brian Fratt, you know, all the, the you know, he's absolute every bit the equal of those guys. Uh, but you just don't ever see them. Mm hmm. Um, this piece was a, a private piece that he did for himself. He just, and, uh, another artist who was working with him, um, you know, was at his house and saw it on his board and was like, oh man, can I buy that? And so he bought it and we subsequently years, 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 many, many, many years later got it from him. Um, but, uh, but the story, this one has an interesting story. It's called the proposal, uh, is what, uh, Ian's title for it. And uh, his story in it is that the dragon has just made a proposal to the maiden where if she is willing to have sex with the dragon, he'll let her go. And she looks like she's considering the offer. She is pondering the offer. And that's why the dragon has that very lascivious look is that's, that's what it actually is. You know, um, you know, so it was others. It was a great story, but it's it's classic McCaig. It's it's ten by fifteen, eleven by fifteen. Uh, it's, it's not it's not a big painting. Uh, we literally, I just I have it up on the wall, actually, uh, right around the hallway. We we haven't had it for like five or six years. Um, it was at my mom's house. I was um, gonna say, was it traveling? Uh, it was, no, it was at your mom's. It was at my mom's house for three or three or four years. And then it was in the Rockwell show. So for the last mm. years, it's been traveling um, in the Rockwell show. We just got it back about two weeks ago. Um, you know, so we, we, it's the first time we've had a chance to really look at it <laughs> for, you know, extensively. Like it's new all over again. For quite some time. Uh, it's one of the fun things when you ship stuff out, when you lend stuff out for exhibitions and it comes back like a year or two later. Um, it's kind of like, oh, wow, hey, cool. You know. <laughs> I forgot I own that. Oh, wow, it's, that, that's really cool. That's a great painting. <laughs> you know. Um, I've had I've had that happen in storage when I'm rearranging storage. It's like, oh, I forgot we owned that. That's really cool. <laughs> we should put that up. You know. Uh, well, I don't own that much art yet, but you know, <laughs> it's a nice feeling. Um, but you know, I, I would have thought this was a larger painting, but still, at a, even at that size, twelve by sixteen, it's still got to be pretty spectacular. It's, it's a, he, he doesn't it, his work is not large. He's 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 he, his all of his stuff is is relatively small. Um, you know, the, the, the biggest, the biggest major McCaig I'm aware of is probably 18 by 24 or so. Mm -hmm. It's done as a commission. Uh, it's Alice in Wonderland, uh, which is staggeringly good. Um, but, uh, but the vast majority of, of his stuff is, is relatively small. Um, you know, it's in that kind of 11 by 14 ish sort of range. Um, but they're amazing. If you want to see, uh, there's, uh, there's a, a, a Games Workshop uh, module booklet called Casket of Souls. 
and uh, McKay did all of the full page interior illustrations plus the cover for that booklet. Um, and it is literally worth buying it just for those, you know, nine or 10 uh, illustrations. Um, all of which, by the way, are owned by Ian Livingston, um, who founded, you know, Games Workshop and mm -hmm. Fighting DLC. And he, he, he owns the whole, he bought the whole book, the whole book of those from McKay. Um, so he owns all of them. So you can't buy them. <laughs> I tried. I've never heard of it, but um, I'm at least going to check it out, see what, uh, there's got to be some interior shots from that too, so we can see them all. Yeah, the, the cover's fabulous. So you, you could at least see that online. I'm I'm gonna Google it in the <laughs> while I'm showing this next piece of art. Uh, this one's by and, and I'm not I I know I'm gonna butcher the last name, so I'll let you do it. I know Darius uh, and then Darius Darius Zawadzki. Zawadzki. All right. And this is an example of another one of those things that's not actually it's you know not an illustrator, not a you know he is a Polish surrealist. Um, but. This is the kind of thing he paints. He paints these kind of cyber creature head things, and his work is just stunningly good. Um, and everything he paints, he sells. He paints, he sells. He paints. You know. So we actually worked with his U.S. agent and commissioned him to do a painting for us so that we could get one. <laughs> um, and it took forever and a day. Um, uh, but finally, they completed this piece, which is 32 by 36, 32 by 35, something in that general range. Um, and uh, it's actually, a, it's called Cyberhead 3, uh, but we, but uh, Jeannie named it Gus. <laughs> so we, we did that, this is Gus. No, it's really, really nice. I've uh, I've seen other paintings by him. I think I think he's very, very talented. And that's that's pretty cool. But again, it, it's funny. So that's a commission piece, though. It wasn't one that, uh, yeah, the only way to get a piece was to actually commission him. It was, it was I mean, pieces, but, okay, but it, was, it was always like a, a, a battle, mm -hmm. you know? And so I concluded that it would be much easier to just commission him to do something. Um, now, you then have the thing, of course, is you get whatever he does, um, you know, but it's, it's, it's easier, you know, and, and it avoided the need of, oh, and boom, suddenly there's one available. And if I don't have X thousands of dollars right at that moment in time, eh, too bad. Try next day. This way you could plan for it. You, know, you could do layaway and you could, you could pay, you know, it made it much more. That's one of the nice things about commissions is it, it eliminates that, that surge of, oh my God, I have to have money now because this is available now. So yeah. in a lot of your uh, c commission experiences, are they, you know, because in, in with comic illustrators, you know, there's it's always varying, right? Do you, do you pay everything down at once to start? Do you, you know, what's what's your experience typically in uh, in in that field as far as you know how much down? It varies. I mean, we don't normally pay anything down. Right. Okay. But but yeah, I'm just curious what the standards are. I mean, is it? It, it varies. I mean, a lot of some of them will, some of them will they'll ask for you know a thousand dollars, you know, or they'll ask for you know just. No, nobody, nobody asks for payment up front. Right. Um, I, I've not ever had that happen. Um, you know, I've had people, I've had artists ask for, you know, like, yeah, we want, we'd like 10,000, you know, on a $65,000 commission, mm -hmm. you know, kind of thing. But they typically aren't asking for huge, huge chunks of money in it, you know. Um, so usually it's, you know, and sometimes it'll be, yeah, I'll give me a deposit and then pay when it's done. Um, you know, artists seem to kind of like that honestly because it takes the pressure off to get it done because a lot of times the time frame that's planned for the commission and the actual time frame for the commission don't mesh particularly well right well you can never tell right with your work schedule i i, I like that better i think in, in comic art i mean i think by and large uh, you see half up front or all up front more often than not and that's where you get into trouble right you, you know the buyer's expectation is one thing the artist's expectation is still you know what their expectation is going into it and you just never know schedule wise I, so i like that the idea that it's more pay pay it at the time of completion and the artist knows that right. they're going to be able to if, if you if they got a thousand dollars or not they're going to be able to sell that painting probably for what they commissioned right. it for if you flaked out they've they're going to have something that they can turn around and still sell because of 
especially if they're confident and you're not and you're not getting commissions from from too many people who probably aren't established enough that they already have a reputation with commissions uh, to a certain degree. Yeah, not generally speaking. I mean, we, we, we pretty much are just because we have a tendency in a lot of cases mm -hmm. to kind of carte blanche commissions. Yeah. You know, we don't commission anybody that we don't trust. I mean, right. we have to be confident that, okay, if I could let this artist do whatever they want, they're going to come up with something that I like, you know? So we don't commission people, generally speaking, um, you know, that, that we don't feel every, every now and then we, we've taken a little bit of a leap of faith. Um, but, but generally speaking, we, you know, if we don't like, you know, at least 90% of what they paint, uh, then eh, maybe commissions, a uh, carte blanche commissions, not the right. Best, you know? Um, so yeah, but, but, but if you, but if you can do it, if you feel comfortable and you can do it, if you can give an artist carte blanche to do whatever they want, you will get the best work. Um, you know, you, you will get the best stuff out of them. Um, it doesn't, and it, well, with comic art, it doesn't happen too often, you know, because usually yeah. you want some, you want a character that the, oh, that the okay. artist is most familiar with or something, but, yeah. uh, but certainly I can see, you know, in, in, in your genre, it, it's a little bit easier, especially oh, yeah. if you know what they're used to painting, you know, it's painting, you, you can probably gauge what, what you're going to get, that you're going to be happy with it. But, uh, but yeah, that never happens. You know, do do whatever you want. They Maybe they might say, no, no, that doesn't happen hardly at all. I can't think of it. I can't think of one time when you'd want to commission somebody, uh, you know, a comic illustrator and not, you know, not have those, just a, a little hint of a direction. Yeah. We, we, you know, I mean, some artists, you know, some artists like the, they, they want the hits, you know, they want the direction, you know, they, okay, here's, here's four thumbnails to choose from. And then, okay, here's the sketch and here's the color sketch. And, and they want you to approve, you know, all the stuff. Mm. Um, which we will do if that's the way they, they like to work. We'll do that. Um, you know, um, but you know, other times I mean, there's, you know, there was a, I, I think it's good. I think it's in here later. There's a John Harris. Um, that I, actually I've got good stories for both John Harris and the Brom. So I'll wait. because I think they're both in here. So we'll, we'll, I'll, okay. I'll wait. well, before we look at the next piece of art, Stanley has asked a good question. Uh, you know, in this genre, is there a preference of buying published art versus unpublished art? You know, because obviously there's in our in comic art, you tend to feel like you have a more uh, set value on a piece that's published versus a piece that was maybe commissioned by somebody else. So in, you know, and I assume that has to play some role in the, uh, you know, in the imaginative arts as well, there might be certain collectors that like to buy published pieces, but is 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 that something that takes precedence when you're when you're thinking about an art purchase? Um, it does massively in certain subgenres. Elsewhere, not nearly as much as it used to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people that are collecting, you know, magic art. You know, people that are collecting, you know, Dungeons and Dragons. You know, people that are collecting like an IP um, or they're collecting an author. Like I know a who collects Robert Silverberg covers, mm -hmm. uh, the book cover done for his books. Uh, then it's very important. Um, and if you're looking at, you know, um, there's, there's a key value to iconic sorts of things. Um, you know, it's not just published, but it's iconic. Um, you know, like, yeah, you're going to pay a lot more money for, you know, a Michael Whalen Elric, you know, although honestly, if you were to buy a newly painted Michael Whalen personal work of Elric, it would be just as damn much money. Um, right. Um, but in those areas, like in magic and where, where it's IP, where it's really IP based, um, publication is everything. Mm -hmm. Um, outside of that, not nearly as much. It used to be that way. It used to be, um, a piece that was unpublished would always be less expensive um, than pieces that were published. And that is not the case anymore at all. Um, and it said, you, again, it used to be, if you did a commission, the commission was going to cost roughly double what buying a pr already painted comparable piece would be. That isn't the case anymore at all either. Um, those things have changed very much with the changes in the market and the, and the changes in the illustration market um, that more and more it is about the artist and about the image. And if it's a book cover, great. But if it's not, you know, it doesn't really make that much difference. 
um, you know, it, it's not going to be more desirable unless it is something noteworthy. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, no, I think that's interesting. And it, you're really collecting the artist at that point. And, um, and while it's important, it's not always the most important thing when you're looking, you know, when you want to get an example of a particular artist. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And I mean, there are people like, I, 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 like I've got someone now collecting, you know, Savage Sword of Conan covers and uh, Epic Magazine covers. Mm -hmm. So for those, yeah, we, they need to be published covers because that's literally what he's collecting. Um, you know, but otherwise, you know, um, you know, people come to IX and let's see, yeah, okay, this is published or not published, or it doesn't doesn't really matter all that much. Sure. No, I mean that's kind of what I, I was expecting too. I, I would think that. You uh, right. Well, you know, and the thing is, there's not. I don't want to say there isn't as big a demand, but I mean, as far as published work that's out there, you know, you've got a lot of great talent out there making art today, and the thing is, there's not enough. Uh, publishing options for the, those wonderful artists to be making art for, unfortunately, right? Whether that's in uh, paperback book covers or, you know, advertising, marketing, those sorts of things. I mean, there just aren't enough venues for it. And uh, and I think that, you know, so it, sh it shouldn't hold that much weight at the end of the day, because if I want to get something from Dave Palumbo, I'm not worried if it's a published piece or not, because I really like his work. And, uh, you know, while it might be nice, sure. I mean, and he because he's somebody who, yeah, uh, does cover work for IDW and a few other places, but he makes such great work. To me, it doesn't matter if I'm buying a piece from him. Uh, it's it's a side consideration, right? If I want to get a published piece or not. Well, that's a big a big part of one of our primary mission goals for IX when we started mm -hmm. the show um, was to help build the market for personal works, gallery works, private commissions over published pieces, which at the time published was the published mattered, you know, mm -hmm. um, because we saw a lot of artists who were not getting the work, um, you know, or not able to compete real effectively because they were traditional and not digital. And so they were slow, um, you know, or they were legends, you know, but publishers have decided that their stuff was kind of well, we, we've moved on now, and so we don't we don't do that look anymore. Now we do this look, um, you know. And so we wanted they were we wanted to to build the market for the work so that the artist would have a market that was not dependent on a publisher hiring them. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the things I am most proud of is the success that we we've kind of had with that. Yeah, that's wonderful. I mean, again, it you got to give uh, artists a reason to, to to make those traditional works, and if you don't have, uh, if you if they don't have the the avenue of getting the work published and getting jobs specifically to do that work, you've got to have uh, a market for you know that supports them. And mm -hmm. certainly, IX has definitely fostered that. And uh, you know, just th those are the resources that they they need. And, uh, and you know, I. I don't know. That's why I've always been supportive of your mission, Patrick, because it's uh, it's very, very important, uh, you know, in order to keep people working traditionally. And, uh, you know, I, I I don't know. It's always the moment you you kind of uh, raise the, the subject with me, you know, and the concept of the show. I was always I was sold from the moment, you know, you did it. So I I commend you on all the work that you've done. Thank you. Well, but that's that's that that's been a primary thing because we were. We were genuinely afraid, um, you know, that the the that there would be no imaginative work being done traditionally, um, because the only market venue was illustration and the digital. They, you, it was too hard to compete digitally mm -hmm. because of the of the pay rates dropping. Um, it was too hard to compete because it takes so much longer to paint something traditionally than it does to do it digitally. Right, and uh, you know that has. Or has not been the case, um, fortunately, um, for uh, for a, a, a host of reasons. But you know, that's we, that was a genuine concern that we had around about two thousand five. No, well, I mean, and, and and you know, the thing is, had you not, you never know where things would have gone. I yeah. Mean, that's, but but the thing is, and you know, we've we've both seen it that in the 
like the Magic the Gathering art market. That that market has changed dramatically in the last five to six years, you know, as far as the prices realized and everything. And I think that that just shows you that it's a it's it's a niche uh, market that's finally catching on and starting to mature. I think you know comic art was probably eight to ten years earlier than that and just continues to grow. But I think that you know in in the genres in which you guys work. Uh, you know, it's still it's 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 still just kind of gaining that momentum, but it's there at least now. We're you know we're seeing oh, yeah. newer artists commanding incredible prices for their Magic the Gathering paintings, right? Traditional paintings, and yeah. uh, and it's amazing to to see that, and uh, but wonderful at the same time. Yeah, it is. It is, and it, it has been. You know, um, you know, and and it it and, and it, because Magic is is entirely its own unique, yeah. you know, uh, variably interesting ver and and out to the level of insane marketplace it is. um i mean uh, uh, it, yeah i i i I'm friends with a bunch of the magic guys and 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 figure them just to kind of keep a, a tab on that market and it's just crazy um you know i don't do a lot with it myself uh, most of their kind of magic and it's magic and maybe magic and maybe, you know um you know i mean i obviously i saw magic artists so mm -hmm. I mean, but it's it's not my primary thing. But uh, I mean, it's just some of the prices for new work. Um, not surprised at insane prices for you know Alpha Black Lotus painting that sold for four point two million. Mm -hmm. I'm not surprised, particularly at that. I'm not surprised at the hundreds of thousands of dollars for you know Wrath of God. You know, I'm not that it, it's the new piece. It's the thing that literally for the card that just came out, you know, that sells for $150,000. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it doesn't happen a lot. Um, you know, but, but, yeah. but again, you know, I, I, that, I think that transcends uh, buying something because the card's important that the art's on too. I mean, at that price, they're not, they're buying it because it's a work of art. I mean, there is something to be said about, you know, artists commanding, you know, a high dollar for a, uh, you know, for, for modern pieces coming out. But at, uh, when it crosses six figures, that that's a little that's something a little different. Right. I mean, I, I think anyway, but uh, but it is it, it's it's interesting and wonderful to see because it, it, it's it's a it's it's happening so quickly in that one niche that uh uh, I just want, you know, I'm a bystander. I'm not a buyer either, but I, I, I try to kind of follow it just, just to kind of see what those numbers are. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, but it's cool. It's great. And I, I, anytime an artist can make money, uh, like that, I That's think it's thing. wonderful. That's a good, happy, positive thing. And it gives them an incentive to paint traditionally. Exactly. Um, the existence of that market means you will make a lot more money if you work traditionally than if you work digitally. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I'd say, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm totally all for it. All right. Well, let's, uh, swing back here to your collected okay. works here. And, uh, here is a piece by Justin Sweet. Yes. Uh, this is not in any way a major piece. Uh, we have a major Justin Sweet. We have Elf Princess, um, which, which is a show piece, which we didn't actually commission. He painted it for the show. Um, and then we bought it afterwards. Um, but. This is a piece, uh, Justin uh, came to IX three or four. Um, he came to a couple, but it was either, either three or four, I think. He came, came to the show um, and he set up an easel at his booth space and he spent, he was late getting in, he didn't get into like Friday morning because he that was working. Um, and he spent the weekend painting and he did this painting while he was over the weekend at the show he painted this piece um, and I just loved it. Um, and so we, we grabbed it and we bought it, you know, um, and it is, it is still, it's one of my favorite Justin Sweet paintings, um, even though it's literally a two and a half day long demo painting, um, <laughs> you know, but it is one of my favorite Justin Sweet paintings. No, that's, well, it's, yeah, the thing is when you get to see him do the work too, I mean, there's something yeah, special with that. So, and they did it at your show. I mean, yeah. that's that's special. But that's why I included it because it's just odd because it's not a major piece. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, it's I mean, it, it's 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 not. But it's like, but I love this painting. There's something about this. I just love this painting. So that, yeah. that's why I included. So I included that one. 
I like it a lot. I mean, there, and you're right. There are Justin's an amazing, amazing artist. So, you know, again, getting just the opportunity to to, to be able to hang out with them for the week weekend and uh, pick up something that they were you got to see them work on. I think that by itself is a is a wonderful story. You know, and it, I like having art that has some kind of you know reference to uh, to to something in my life or something that happened around me. I think that those uh, it just makes the artwork more special. So that's that's awesome. Well, most of what we have now um, are pieces that either we commissioned uh, or some way involved with, or at a minimum are pieces that we got from artists who are, who are friends. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there, there's some sort of, you know, connected connectedness to most of what we have at this point. Most of the stuff that wasn't, that we didn't have any personal connection to even fabulous stuff. Um, you know, the, Jeff Jones and San Julian and, and, and those kinds of things. Um, um, well, give me one second. I just realized that my uh, laptop is not in fact plugged in. Oh, well, we and can't if, have that. If I don't get it plugged in, it's telling me that it's going to stop. <laughs> right. We'll be cutting our interview very short. To, well, not very short, but uh... it was plugged into the surge strip, but the surge strip was not actually plugged into the wall. So, all right, now we should be good. All right, emergency averted. So, uh, but yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, let's see. The next piece right. is uh, Luke Hillestad. Yep, this is another example of uh, a a a more mainstream figurative artist who is doing imaginative kind of themed work. Uh, we've shown Luke at IX Gallery um, and have sold some of his stuff. You know. And uh, this is a piece called Artemis. It's huge. It's 42 by 60. Um, and uh, it, it, it glows. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, he, he's a student. There's a, a Norwegian figurative painter named Odd Nerdrum, uh, who is one of the more famous 20th century figurative artists. And uh, you know, Luke is a student of his. He studied with, with Odd. And so the, they're a part of a, a movement that's kind of called the kitsch movement. And, uh, so this is an example of, of kind of some of the sorts of, of things where you have an imaginative theme, but it's not fantasy and science fiction. Um, you know, it is imaginative realism. It is not fantasy and science fiction. Right. Um, you know, this, of course, is the mythological reference. Um, you know, but uh, and, and, and there's more and more of that these days. Um, which is cool because it gives you more options, but it also gives you more options, which is which can be bad. <laughs> that, it's a huge painting as well. It is a huge painting. It's amazing. Uh, yeah, it, it is a huge, it is a huge, huge painting. Um, it, it, it gets again. It's it's Gene and I both just, we love this painting. Um, it, it's actually it's hanging in Jeannie's office, um, actually, and uh, you know, it's uh, it, it's it's kind of a you know, when, when you have the, the, it's interesting that the number of mainstream painters who are fantasy and science fiction fans um, and who are heavily influenced by fantasy and science fiction artists, mm -hmm. um, even though like Jeremy Mann, I did not include our Jeremy Mann. Um, Jeremy Mann is a hugely popular contemporary figurative painter, paints beautiful women. Uh, which is, that's if, if you want to make money painting contemporary figurative art, that's what you paint. Uh, but he's stunning, he's beautiful, wonderful, brilliant, genius, genius guy. Um, super nice too. And, uh, you know, he and his influences when he was young were Rosetta and Boris and St. Julian. And, you know, and he doesn't paint that subject matter. But those are the artists that he was influenced by. Right. Um, you know, there's an artist named Jeff Watts, uh, which some of you may be, if you've ever heard of the Watts Atelier, uh, the Watts School out in, out in California. Mm -hmm. uh, Eric Gist and Lucas Graziano and Mike Hayes have all taught there. Uh, Jeff Watts is a, he's a, a well-known you know, figurative painter who runs the, who runs the Atelier. Um, but again, his love is, fantasy and science fiction. Um, and he said when he was coming up in the 80s, 
if he could have made a living doing gallery paintings of fantasy and science fiction, that's what he would have done. Um, but then you couldn't make a living doing that. You know, now you can. Right. You know, um, you know, Scott Burdick is another one. If you see his, he's wonderful paintings. He does a lot of uh, kind of Tibetan uh, sort of uh, Asian kind of themed things. Um, but while he's building his career doing this, he's painting covers for Dragon Magazine um, and D&D modules because he loves D&D and he loves fantasy. And the art director pissed him off so badly he swore he'd never work for them again and he never illustrated after that. <laughs> you know? But that's it. But he you know, he but he did this because he loved he loves the genre. Right. Well, it's really interesting because you, you see a lot of these people, you know, and it's surprising the number of younger artists. I mean, I'm talking like you know, 50s and under, um, who are really big, not only really big fans, you know, but specifically influenced by Boris Frazetta, Jeff Jones, you know, San Julian, cite those people as influences mm -hmm. um, on their work, which is really interesting. Certainly. And uh, now next artist here is Stephen Hickman, mm -hmm. who I fortunately got to meet numerous times going to IX, uh, who left us uh, far too soon, just a couple of years ago or a year and a half ago. Yes. But I uh, always loved his work. Steve was a dear friend of ours. Um, you know, he, he was he was just one of the most amazing people you will ever have met. Um, anybody that met him, that got to spend any time with Steve is way better off for the experience. Um, but this is a piece that we commissioned from him back in 2015. Or 20, it was 2015. It was like 2015. Um, and uh, it's called a Mirshima. And is the largest painting Steve ever did. Uh, it's 32 by 53, something in that general vicinity. Um, and this is an example of one where, where um, it wasn't just a carte blanche paint, whatever. Um, we talked to Steve about a commission. We said we wanted him to do a big one, you know. And he said, well, there's some different things, different ideas I have. He says, but, you know, he says, there's this, there's this, I did this painting called the Sea of Vinyu, um, which he did. Year, you know, several years, years, years earlier, you know, like 15 years earlier, um, which is the same scene, but it's like daytime and it's nice and it's pretty. And instead of the monkey, there's this boy with a lute because Steve was, Steve loved to paint lutes and things and stuff like that. Uh, musical instruments, there's a lot of music features in his work. And he said, I always had this idea of doing the dark version of that painting. And I did the drawing for it, you know, 18 years ago. You know, but I've never had the time to paint it. And so he sent us the drawing, which is, was amazing. You know. And so we commissioned him to paint it um, so that he would have the opportunity to paint that piece. Um, and at the same time, to produce the biggest thing that he, as it turned, the biggest thing he would ever paint. Um, you know, this is one of the top three of our favorite pieces. Um, you know, both because of the painting and because of Steve. Um, this one hangs downstairs in, in our, uh, in our living room. Wow. I mean, that's, uh, that's impressive. His work was, is very stunning. I mean, I, I you know, I pr appreciate the fact that I got to see so many of his paintings in person, but, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, and, and he did some published work throughout his, you know, throughout his career too. Well, he was very prolific, I think, early on, right? I mean, well, probably throughout his entire career. Yep, because he was hugely prolific. 70s, 80s, 90s, right? He, he was very prolific. There are hundreds of hits. I mean, he did creepy uh, covers. I mean, he did a lot of different uh, different mm -hmm. stuff. So things that, you know, I think artists who are in more in my my side of the world have seen his work and probably weren't familiar with it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah Steve, Steve, Steve did everything. At some point, there, there there's Hickmans of, of all of all sorts and shapes and sizes, um, and they're all brilliant. They're all wonderful. Well, all them. Like Steve did do the occasional not brilliant painting, but they're all good. Um, you know, and then the style varied a little bit over time. Uh, fabulous Tolkien. Yeah, you know, if you if you if you have pay any attention to Tolkien art, um, you've seen Steve's stuff, whether you recognize it or not. Um, there's a very famous painting uh, called The Black Rider. Um, oh, yeah. 
of, of the Hobbit standing as the Black Riders leaning over in the Shire, demanding to know where, the, you know, where the Hobbits are. Uh, that's a Hickman. Um, and uh, you know, there's there's uh, just he just did he, he loved he loved doing Tolkien, um, and he also loved uh, Art Deco. It was very Art Deco, Art Nouveau. You can see it in all of his work. Mm-hmm. Um, you know. And uh, lately, at the end of his life, he was painting. He was very into a series of archers, uh, painting beautiful nude female archers and mermaids, like kind of alien reptilian sort of but beautiful mermaids. Um, those were kinds of things. Uh, there are no museums of this genre of art right now. Um, there, there will be some, uh, but right now, Stanley, there are there are no museums of the genre there's no museum where you can go to to see anything um but there will be there will be uh but right now yeah you can't go you can go and see cool things that are progenitors i mean you can go to the delaware museum and see the piles you can go to the brandywine museum and see the wyaths and 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 uh and cornwalls and uh cornwalls and and paris you you can see those things Mm -hmm. um but you, there, there isn't any place that you can go and see these things on a permanent display. Uh, so they, they'll do shows. I mean, obviously they did like they just did the Enchanted show, right? Um, you know, and, and there's a Donato show or was the Donato show in Huntsville, um, and you know we did at the Edge in Allentown. There's you know, there's there's ind- there'll be individual exhibitions, but nobody has a permanent has any kind of a permanent collection on display of anything contemporary imaginative. And that's why the IX Art Show is so special because it is like a uh, a museum exhibition. I mean, at the end of the day, you're never going to see anything quite like it, and every year is different. Yep, it only lasts for five. It's a five day. It's a very short lived museum every year. Yeah, and uh, let's see. So, yeah, the next up is a piece you kind of mentioned earlier, and one that that I've got to see in person because it was a commissioned piece for IX. This is that uh, Brahm painting you were yep. talking about. This is this is uh, the, the we commissioned Brom, uh, both he and his wife Laurie. His wife Laurie is, is a fabulous painter as well, uh, and they came to the show. We commissioned both of them to do pieces for for the show that year, um, and this is a complete carte blanche. Um, we agreed, uh, okay, it's going to be you know forty by sixty, and it's going to be this price, and that was it. And then a couple of months later, I get an email from Brom. Uh, and he says, "Hey, I'm, I, I finished that painting, um, but but I want you to know if you don't like it, um, it, it's it's fine, it's totally cool. I will hap- I'll paint you something else if this isn't what you wanted. If you want something more typical, fan- yeah, I will totally paint you something else." And uh, so he, he attached the image, uh, and of course I looked at it and said, "You know, are you insane?" <laughs> yeah. And it turned out it was, well, no, it, it was more, I was hoping you wouldn't like it because I wanted to keep it. It uh, was spectacular. I mean, it, it, I, what was the size on this thing? I mean, it was like, it seemed like it was like three and a half by five. It was just 40, massive. 40, 45 by 54. Okay. So yeah, even a little bit larger than I thought, but it was, it was unbelievable. And you could tell how proud he was. I mean, uh, at the show when it was on display, I mean, it was uh, the, the centerpiece on his wall, you know, and as well, it should have been because it, it is amazing. And, and we've barely had it. Um, you know, this was a 2017 commission and, you know, we got the painting and then Brom entered it in the ARC salon competition, uh, which is the, you know, one of the more prestigious figurative art competitions. Um, they have an imaginative realism category now because we convinced them to add one. Um, and I, I judge that, Jeannie and I judge that show, that, ex, that uh, we judge the salon every year as well. And uh, he entered this in the salon and he won the imaginative realism category with this painting, uh, which then means that <coughs> the ARC uh, wanted to exhibit it at their at their their salon exhibition in new york and in madrid and you know brahm wanted it to be in the show uh so we lent the painting to the arc and it was gone for a year or 15 months or something like that uh while it was shown in new york and then it was shown in madrid at mayhem and then then it came back 
Um, and then we didn't even have back that long. And then the Rockwell wanted it for the Enchanted show. Um, so we lent it to the Enchanted show. Uh, and it's, it was gone there for two years. And we just got that back about two weeks ago. So we've had it for, you know, six years, but it's only been here for about half that time. Wow. Well, it just shows you how impressive it was. I mean, like, uh, like Rick Welch just said, he, you know, he, he knew it was a keeper. I mean, at the end of the day, it, yeah, I, I could only imagine you couldn't email him back fast enough to say, we'll keep it. Yes, no, we'll, we'll, no, sorry, Brown, but no, we will be taking that painting. <laughs> you know, and he said, yeah, I was really hoping he wouldn't like it because it's the best thing I've ever painted. Um, you know, I said, yeah, it is the best thing you've ever painted. And yeah, I'm not stupid. So yes, I'm going to be, we'll, we will take that. Uh, I give him full credit for honesty, though, because he could have just not shown it to me and waited another two months and painted something else. Very uh, true. I just showed that, you know, he could have just, he could have done that and he didn't. I mean, so, um, which I really appreciate, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's this, we just, this is also in our top three. Um, cause it's just, it's fabulous. Yeah. Uh, never, I never had McGinnis, uh, would, would like to have had McGinnis, uh, but never had McGinnis. Yeah, that would, uh, McGinnis would have been incredible. Now here's a, uh, here's another commission piece. Cause I, well, and just, this was a, uh, IX book cover for infected by art as well. So, you know, I got to see this image a lot and, uh, this one was too. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is a piece. Uh, this is another example. Uh, this is a gallery painter, um, an artist named Chie Yoshi. Uh, she, she does gallery painting. Um, you know, she does kind of, kind of works like, um, Brad does, but she's much younger. She's, you know, not as established as Brad, uh, her work is amazing. I love her stuff. Um, and, uh, we invited her, you know, I had, had invited her to come to the show just some time in the process. And, uh, she decided to come one year because she thought it'd be fun and would be cool. Um, uh, and so when we found out that she was going to come to the show, we said, Hey, will you do a commission? Um, because I'll be honest, I wanted to see a Yoshi painting. And, uh, you know, so she said, sure, that'd be great. You know, so we, we gave her the carte blanche, just go paint, whatever. Um, and, uh, this is what she did. Uh, it's called red dragon. It's 20 by 30 or 24 by 36. I can't remember which one to the 20 by 30 or 24 by 36. Um, and, uh, it is, you know, it is, is a Japanese fairy tale about a woman who, is actually a dragon um and that's the symbolism of the dragon kimono is that she's really a dragon and uh you know it's beautiful it's 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 just it's her stuff is just staggeringly good um you know she's she's wanted to come back to the show again but i'm afraid that she's now getting into the kunkel zone where she just sells everything um you know and doesn't have enough work available that she could actually bring to a show and exhibit, mm -hmm. you know, uh, which is the one drawback of having a show where you mandate everybody come and exhibit original art is people that don't have originals because they've sold them all can't ever come. Right. Um, you know, so, or, or people that don't want to sell anything. Um, you know, it's hard to, you know, we've, I've been trying to talk to Tony Dinalizzi in the coming for years. Um, you know, and, and, you know, but Tony doesn't sell his work anymore. You know, he has no interest in selling his work. And so he doesn't really have any incentive to come and sit at a table for five days, you know, with a batch of paintings that he doesn't want to sell. Honestly, you know. Yeah, but it, but I mean, at least someone like that, you could still see them coming out because they'd like their work to be seen. They might like to be able to enjoy the camaraderie of hanging out with their peers a little bit. But, uh, you know, as a collector, you're, you're, you're not really getting anything, but at least you're getting to see the work. I mean, right. there's, there's worse things. Oh yeah. Well, no, like we did, like we had Larry Elmore, uh, yeah. in, in 21, Larry said he has all this, this whole batch of classic paintings that he won't sell, that his family will not allow him to sell. Um, that he's been offered stupid amounts of money for, and the family will not allow him to sell the paintings. Um, but he brought them with him to the show to exhibit them. Um, so that people could see them, including things like Avalon and the Life Giver, mm -hmm. uh, which is probably one of his most, one of his more famous paintings. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, it was amazing to, to have them there. And he's like, yeah, just, I'll bring them. I'll bring them all. And so we gave him a big space. So we had plenty of room to, 
you know, and he brought two paintings to sell and a dozen paintings to show. And he sold the two paintings he brought to sell and everybody loved the other dozen. <laughs> and some of them wanted to buy them, but they weren't for sale. And that's okay. They were not for sale. With a show like yours, I mean, the thing is there's, there's so much other artwork to look at that you're not going to, you might walk away a little bit disappointed, but as a, as an art collector, you're, I think you're just happy to have been able to see it in person. Oh, yeah. You know, reproductions are great and everything, but uh, there's still nothing like seeing the, the original, just like you were talking with the Bobers. They don't reproduce quite as well as they, they, they it really is in person. So uh, that is, uh, you know, that's a reward in and of itself for art collectors, I think. Yeah. Uh, ben, the dragon lady is uh, an artist named Chie Yoshi. Um, the, uh, the, the stag girl on the horse was the bra. Yep. And I put, uh, Chie Yoshi's, uh, proper spelling in the chat. if anybody missed that, it's a couple up from my, uh, from Ben's comment there. Uh, now you talked about this artist a little bit earlier as well. Matthew Stewart battle under the, under the mountain. I mean, this is, uh, I think I saw this one. I mean, but it, it's a large painting, right? Mm -hmm. Vertically. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh. 20 something by 50 something. Yeah. Um, and this was, this was one of the early IX commissions. This was like IX two or three, um, where we, we first, it was the first time we, we really did the, we want you to do, cause, cause Matt loves to paint Tolkien. Mm -hmm. um, and at the time he was, he was young and, you know, he was, he was just kind of breaking into the field at the time. Um, He's much more established now, and he's a very well-known magic, you know, artist. Um, but he loved to paint Tolkien. Tolkien's he loves to do Tolkien. He still loves to paint Tolkien. And you know, I'd always had this dream of having a, a massive painting of the Battle of the Five Armies. So we said, Matt, how about would you do a, a big painting of the Battle of the Five Armies? And he's like, that would be awesome. And so this is what he did. Um, and it's called Battle of the Mountain. Uh, but this is this is his Battle of the Five Armies painting, um, and uh, it's 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 big and impressive. It's oil on masonite, uh, weighs a thousand tons. Um, great story. Uh, Matt was trying to avoid shipping the painting because of the size, and so uh, it turned out Jeannie was going to visit her mom who lived in Danbury, Connecticut. And Matt lives in Running New Jersey, just outside of Philly. And so they agreed that, well, Matt would just drive up to Jeannie's mom's and meet her when she was there and give her the painting. And then she could just put it in the car and bring it home with her. Um, so, so Matt got to go up, uh, went up there and did the thing. And then there's, just, there's lots of long running jokes about Jeannie's mom insisting that he eat and feeding him sandwiches and yogurt and <laughs> and all kinds of other stuff as he had that you know couldn't, couldn't go away hungry and so he's she's throwing all kinds of food at him while he's there so um but yeah but this this is this, this is an early piece this is the cover um we use this for the cover of the first Ilix concepts book that we did uh we did Ilix concepts for five years and then it just got too too much of a hassle and too expensive um and so we stopped doing it but this was the cover of the first Ilix concepts that we did and this is an example of a piece that uh, we commissioned it for the show and it was done for IX, but then Matt subsequently sold the rights to it uh, to an ad for the Science Fiction Book Club, I think. Well, I mean, it, uh, deservedly so. I mean, it's such a great image. but and, and Matt's one of the more prolific published artists that are out there today. I mean, he's, he's, he's high in demand. His work is just, you know, I think he's fairly quick but uh it's it, he's just really impressive i mean I, i've yet to pick up anything by him when i go to that show only because i don't know what to pick up because i like everything he does you yeah. know what i mean it's all good by tolkien right <laughs> that is exactly what i should do i should just throw caution to the wind and just say <laughs> I, I can't go wrong by buying anything that he does related to tolkien yes because matt, matt loves tolkien uh, he's a great tolkien painter he had the painting you needed, which is Eowyn at the Gates of Medusel, um, which is one of the best paintings Matt has ever done. And it's just staggeringly good. Uh, but I sold it uh, to the guy who's going to have the Scottish Museum. So it would be on exhibit. Uh, we'll be able to see it, but it's no longer available to acquire. 
then it's going to the right place then. Yeah. then many, many people will get to appreciate it then. Yes. yes. Now, uh, next piece, Patrick Jones. Mm -hmm. uh, unbelievable painting. I, I know I, I got to see this one. This was the cover for Ibit 2. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, Patrick's just absolutely amazing. And he's he's very engaging gentleman in person. Uh, I, I think he comes out every every other year to IX because he's based in Australia. Yeah, yeah, he 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 hasn't been in a while. Uh, the COVID screwed everything up, but he was he was coming every other year. Was his name? He would alternate years uh, and to come to the show. But yeah, this is uh, called Conan the Conquered, um, and this is an example of this is another example where we there where we 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 actually did have a target. Uh, cause it's like Patrick likes to paint Conan and he likes to paint women. Uh, and I said, how about Conan fighting a group of Amazons? And he said, Oh, well, I could do that. <laughs> Patrick's Irish. Um, he lives in Australia now, but he's Irish. And, uh, so, so this is 40 by 60, um, oil and linen. Um, we, it was cool. He actually, uh, has, has done, uh, some, he teaches and has done a bunch of instructional videos. And so he actually, uh, recorded a lot of the process of painting this. So we got to watch a lot of him actually working on it. I think he said they ended up something, something 400 ish hours, um, that he spent on this piece. Wow. Um, but it's, it's fabulous. I mean, we just, we love this painting. It's just amazingly good. Yeah, and he's pretty. He's pretty big on doing the instructional videos and mm -hmm. uh, you know art instruction remotely. Whether they're yeah, he's that's cool. I mean, I, I, that's a niche that he uh, he definitely excels at. I think yeah. I've, I've always been on his mailing list and just it'd be a, for at least a dozen years it feels like, and I just always check out what he's working on. I think that uh, I, I don't know. I just admire that. You know, when a, when an artist has this entrepreneurial spirit that. Kind of goes beyond their desire just to create art but to uh to, to do something educational as well like this I, I, I he's just a very interesting guy he's, he's, he's a great guy um he teaches in australia he teaches in an actual school in australia but then he does all his stuff but like for example you want to basically he does commissions um at this point it is relatively rare for him to just paint something that then becomes available for sale mm -hmm. um he pretty much is just he's pretty much just taking commissions uh, for people. Uh, so if you want a Patrick Jones, you can get one, but you pretty much have to commission one unless you find, you know, one that somebody had that, that occasionally someone that, you know, bought one, the previous painting will sell it. Um, you know, but, uh, but he isn't really doing work for sale. He pretty much just gets commission every now and then he does something. He did a, he did a Deja Forest. Uh, not long ago that he was just felt like doing a Deja Thoris. So we did a Deja Thoris. Um, you know, but but uh but by and large he just kind of does his his things. But he's just incredibly good. Um you know and 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 very very distinctive. Yeah. No, I agree. Uh let's see now back over to uh something Tolkien and this is by a uh, Greg Hildebrandt. Mm -hmm. I believe I saw this one at the show. I mean, smog destroys Lake Town. This this is a, this is this is one of the the non IX IX pieces. Yeah. Um, where uh, we did not commission this painting, um, you know, and uh, but uh, when Gene and Greg were coming to the show, and Gene Gene Greg's wife and manager um, and boss um, decided that it would be good, it would be cool if he were doing a painting. I mean, if he, if he work, was working on a painting at the show, mm -hmm. that would be a cool thing. And so she informed him, uh, by the way, Greg, you're going to do a, a big smog painting. And he said, oh, I am. Yes, you are. You're going to do a big smog painting. <laughs> um, so he did the, the big smog painting. It's 33 by 53, I think. 32 by 52, something in that range. Um, and uh, he, he worked on, you know, had it, a lot of it done um, and then brought it to IX back at IX three, I think it was. Um, and then spent the week to, to working on it. You know, just sat at his, sat at his desk table and talked to people and, and, and worked on the painting. Um, and of course, Gina thought, Oh my God, it's amazing. It's fabulous. It's wonderful. He did it for the show. Oh God, but we couldn't afford it. Um, you know, so it, it went back, went back home with him. 
Um, and fortunately, nobody else could afford it either. Um, and so a few years later, um, uh, TSR guy came along um, offering stupid amounts of money to buy all the TSR stuff and take it to Hong Kong. Uh, and so we sold him uh, the, the remaining TSR stuff that we had. Uh, and the first thing that we did with that money was to call Gene and Greg and buy this thing. Um, so that's where, where this one came in um, for its process. We, we do have a commission from Greg, uh, but the commission is a pinup. Um, so we, 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 cause Greg, does, Greg does fantasy science fiction and he does pinups. Right. Pinup, that's his two things. And so we did, we commissioned the pinup uh, from him, but, but this is the piece that we, uh, so we're thrilled to have this one. And it's, it's, it's amazing in person. And it's, it's the second smog. The main, the first smog is the one that he and his brother did for the Tolkien calendar in 77. Right. Which I think they sold for $250,000, Um, You know, this is the, this is the others. This is the, the next smog. Um, that was done, but it's the cover of the. They did a, a, he did a new a new uh, to, uh, Tolkien art book, and they made this the cover of the Tolkien art book, which is cool. Yeah, it's it's gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. And anybody who grew, grew up with those uh, Hildebrandt calendars back in the day, you know, you'll always have an affinity for uh, for their work without you know without question. I've got a few prints because I can't afford originals, but I've got a few prints from uh, from that period. Yeah hanging on the walls uh not that you can see in my office but uh, i've got some in the in the main house so it's uh but it but it is i mean you just if you were a tolkien fan i mean the hildebrandt brothers really kind of defined uh that time period for me you know i mean i was uh i, I read it probably for the first time around 79 or 80 and uh yeah so it's just that right right moment and it might have even been the hildebrandt brothers that made me want to read it because i love their art and i was like what the hell is uh you know lord of the rings and there you go Yep. So, yeah, there are a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, I just, just talk about my, and I was always real happy with the, the smog because my my favorite. I'm one of those one of those heretical types uh, where my favorite Tolkien is actually The Hobbit. Mm. Um, ah, well, it's it's not, most people's least favorite. It's not nearly as important as The Lord of the Rings. It mm -hmm. is not really as meaningful as The Lord of the Rings. It's not, but it's actually my favorite. Um, you know, so so smog is like you know you'll note that, that's why I've got I have more. Smog and Battle of the Five Armies, and you know that I do, Aowens and and you know, those right. kinds, of, you know, which is not actually deliberate. It just kind of works out that way. Now this is a it's Stanley always asks the tough questions, but uh, and, and I know this you could probably talk for for an hour on this, but give Stanley the two minute version of what are the origins of this art genre. Uh, two minute version. Um, I actually did a lecture on this for uh, Vision X. Um, my, my, I, I've gone through a couple of different, uh, my, my, my current theorem um, is that basically it is a, an unavoidable outgrowth of scientific development at the end of the 19th and at the beginning of the 20th century, um, where we suddenly start seeing rather than just the regurgitation of prior imaginative imagery, like the you know, got the Paraphylites painting King Arthur and painting you know Jason and the party, but rather than that, we suddenly start seeing new imaginative narratives, um, and we see it in literature, um, which is you know what, what we, we we see that, and and we also see it in the visual arts um, going along with the literature, um, but it, it's this it's this incredible period between. 1900 and 1920 mm -hmm. uh, or, or so uh, where it just you have this sudden colossal explosion um, in a way where you had nothing new really no significant new kind of imaginative mythologies for centuries and suddenly in the span of like 30 years you've got Tarzan and you've got Conan and you've got the War of the Worlds, and you've got King Kong, and you've got the Wizard of Oz, and you've got some of all of Superman. Suddenly, all of this stuff is within 30 years. Um, and so my, my current belief is that it's, it's, a, it's an outgrowth of the expansion of, of technological horizons, rendering science fiction 
as not only a viable but an unavoidable thing. Um, and that then leads to new world building. And Flash Gordon. Uh, that then leads to new world building and new uh, kinds of developments, both in fantasy as well as sci-fi. But sci-fi is a progenitor because there was no old sci-fi. Sci-fi was new mm -hmm. before. Um, so therefore, that helps to drive you know, the development of new narratives. That's my, my theory on where it came about. Um, how I mean, we it makes a lot of sense, though. It really does. Yeah, and, and really. That, that's the era when when uh, when things really got were, were percolating and people were encouraged to be creative. I mean, comic strips uh, that we are most memorable, uh, you know, kind of come out of that era, you know, from whether it's Harriman or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, other other. Uh, illustrators of that time so same sort of thing but uh but yeah stanley stanley would, would love the two-hour lecture Patrick. <laughs> and maybe one day we could do something like that if you're ever ever interested but it, but i i agree and, and but with something like that it would be cool to be able to show examples and talk more about it well, sure. I, I, I did a presentation i did an hour ish long presentation for vision x so i actually do have the powerpoint uh, I, I do have the presentation actually for that uh, what, what is imaginative realism? What's the history of imaginative realism? Cool. I mean, if you ever wanted to do it, I would love to uh, to host it with you if you were ever open to that. I mean, if you wanted it out there for posterity. I yeah, mean, I can say I did. I did it for Vision X two years ago. Cool. Uh, and uh, but I I would like to get it a little more widely disseminated. Yeah, uh, well, yeah that'd be cool. I'm I'm up for it. Like I said, the nice awesome. thing, I don't I don't have to do anything because I already. <laughs> <laughs> I already it's already done. I've already done the you know I've already done that. So all right, awesome. Well that 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 makes it easy then. We'll we'll yeah. talk. We'll figure out when we can fit it into both our schedule. Okay, cool. So so stay tuned, Tim. You, you, you'll you can you can come and watch that and I will I will give you all kinds of demonstrations and examples and and all sorts of stuff. Awesome. Uh, now, now this next person is an artist that I didn't know anything about until I went to, uh, to an IX prior to probably maybe the last ones before goggle works, I think. But I remember walking into this mid, uh, hallway underneath the museum and it was all Dorian Vallejo paintings. Not that there were many cause they were so large. They filled the, you know, there was like two per wall. They were, you know, they were overwhelming, but, uh, but you know, incredibly impressive, uh, works of art. And uh, this one's entitled Drifting. Mm -hmm. Drifting. Um, and it is 57 by 67 um, on canvas. And uh, this is another one that we, 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 had, to go, we went to, had to go to Dorian's house with a van uh, to pick it up, to bring it home. Um, but it, uh, Dorian is one of the people. Dorian is Boris Vallejo's son. Um, he is not Julie's son. He is Boris's son with his first wife. Um, but he is, he was an illustrator um, and you've seen his, you know, Savage Sword covers and book cover. Yeah, he, he, and then he decided he, would, he, didn't, want, he didn't want to illustrate anymore. Um, and he became a portrait painter. Um, you know, very, very, very expensive, high-end, you know, rich people portrait type things. Um, and he did that for a while. And then he kind of started doing, uh, you know, figurative, he wanted to kind of figurative gallery work and he started doing this this kind of work um and uh all just amazingly good i mean just uh, he, he's a stunningly good painter um you know we uh for, for a long time he wouldn't sell and he wouldn't sell his illustration he just kept all the old illustrations and he didn't want to sell any of them and he finally got him selling them so we, we've been selling i've actually been selling a fair number of his illustrations i sold all his savage sword covers now um, you know, and have sold a fair, you know, he, he's been, he's been doing, you know, he's been selling, uh, you know, that stuff now. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, he, he does this, 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 this whole series was kind of a dream, kind of a sort of a dream narrative, um, kind of thing. And I just saw this painting at the show and just loved it. Um, and so, you know, a couple of years later, um, you know, I, I told Dorian how much I loved it, and a couple of years later, we actually were able to, you know, come to an agreement on it, and we we got it, and it's also hanging in Jeannie's office. Yeah, well, her office doesn't have a lot of uh, available wall space, given the uh, couple oh. paintings we know that's in there. Oh, her office is no actually. Her, her office has the Dorian is in there, the Patrick Jones is in there, um, the Jeremy Mann is in there, and that Luke Hillestad is in there. 
Wow. Does she have a window? Does, does she get any natural light in the room? Oh, no, no, there, there, there are two windows. Okay. Uh, there's just nothing else. There's two windows and these paint. <laughs> That's amazing. It's pretty much what it what it boils down to. Now, I know this this next piece, we, we've talked about this one before. I mean, it was a piece that uh, was commissioned and I got to see at IX. And, but we've, we've had fun, uh, a few fun conversations about it after the fact, because I, I, you know, I asked, you know, what do you do with this thing? And uh, you said it's, it's good for uh, putting out front, you know, or, or near the door for trick-or-treaters. Uh, you, you, you are that house, right? I mean, yes, we put it. But this is a great story. This, this is another one of the funny stories um, where uh, we commissioned Tom because we really wanted to have a major Tom. And uh, originally he was going to do Kali. Um, he was going to do kind of a six arm, you know, Kali. And he had some months passed and he, he, he called and he said, you know, I really want to do Medusa. I just, I just have this, like, I really, really, really want to do Medusa. Can I do Medusa instead of Kali? And we said, okay, fine. If you want to do Medusa, okay, go ahead. You can do Medusa. Um, and so he, he, yay. And so he went, and this is what he came up with. Um, this is uh, six and a half feet tall. Uh, so it is life-sized. Um, and the uh, unexpected thing about it uh, is that it's in two pieces for, for transport. Uh, the, 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 she, she comes apart at the waist, basically. Um, so the, 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 the stock and the coil is one piece and then the top. And Tom very carefully designed the base so that it would be stable, um, but would fit through a door. Ah, well, that's, that's wise. But he designed it to fit through a 36 inch door. Um, our house was built in 1947. Our <laughs> front door is 36 inches. The interior doors and hallways are not 36 inches. So this piece lives in the corner next to the giant um, Chris Remmer's painting because we literally can't move it into any other room in the house. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh so it really does greet everybody as they come through. You, you, you come into the house and there's Medusa. Um, you know, and everybody's like, oh, wow, that's, that's, that's. <laughs> not what I was expecting, but. Uh, yes, people have. Conversation piece. It is. <laughs> Almost every, it's, it's amazing the responses we get from like delivery guys and plumbers and electricians and, you know, random people that just kind of come to the house having no idea, uh, you know, what to expect. Uh, I mean, we've actually had, you know, workers call friends and have friends come over, <laughs> uh, <laughs> see, you know, to, to see, to see the stuff. Um, people respond. We, the, the, the funniest one we ever had was um, we had uh, Ralph Horsley was at IX and he flew back to England. And this is when we were doing the show in Altoona. We would take all of the artwork from the show people shipped in. We would take it all back home with us and have FedEx come and pick it all up. And so uh, we brought Ralph's crate, his 110 pound crate back home with us. Um, Ralph is the reason we stopped doing that. Uh, but he had DHL, he wanted DHL, so, okay, fine, DHL's coming to get it. Um, and the DHL driver shows up to pick up his crate and he comes in and he's like, oh, wow, this is, this art is so cool. And, he says, yeah, boy, you know, I was friends with this guy. Um, this guy, this, I worked in a frame shop and he used to bring his stuff in to get framed and he did this kind of stuff. Um, you know, I, he gave me a print once. And I said, really, what was his name? Oh, it was Keith Parkinson. <laughs> that the guy worked at a frame shop in Pittsburgh. Right. Keith lived in Pittsburgh and Keith used to have his work framed there. And I was like, oh my God, wow, Keith, we, we have a Keith Parkinson, actually. We don't now, but we did then. Um, and uh, yeah, so that was a you know, small world, you know, but, uh, yeah, but, this, but yeah, Medusa's, Medusa's awesome. Uh, we decorate her for Christmas. Um, we, we, we hang, we hang Christmas balls. I was going to say, do you put bulbs or lights on her? Yeah, we hang Christmas balls from the family. <laughs> and then Jeannie will usually, she'll put like a garland between the hands and then we'll put Christmas cards in the garland. 
Um, <laughs> since she has to stay here, she gets decorated. Mm -hmm. As as she should. Yeah. So, I, I, I had a feeling that something had to be held in her hands from time to time. Yes. Yeah. Right? She, she. Yeah. She. She does. She. She gets decorated for Christmas. Awesome. <laughs> That's great. No uh, you know, and it's funny. I should have asked to see because I remember when I dropped off those books at one time. It was during COVID and everything, so I didn't even ask to go in your house. We were, we talked out in the front lawn for a while, but yeah, I should have asked to at least see. Look in the door, thing. and you could have. Yeah, she I was, should have. I should have got a selfie. Oh well, next time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. We got two more pieces to look at. Okay, and uh, they're both. Pretty spectacular. Uh, you know, I would have been disappointed if you didn't include something by Donato. Okay. And you have. And I, again, a very large painting, I'm sure. This is this is uh, the commission that Donato did for us for the show. Uh, it's called Portal, and it's 40 by 60. Um, so it's big. Um, and it has this beautiful you know, art deco frame that Donato got put on it in, in New York at his fancy frame shop. Uh, normally we frame our things, you know, here, but this one he he offered to get the frame for, um, and so we just paid him to to have it framed uh, the way he wanted it because we knew that he would get a nicer frame than we could get here. Um, so uh, this is one, you know, uh, we commissioned him. Uh, same thing, you know. Okay, this size, this price, you know, and uh, he came up with two sketches. He said, I've got two ideas. You know, one is was kind of in his his uh, you know not not his robot series, but kind of the old man and the stones and the thing series. And then one was this piece. <clears throat> and he said, you know, which which of the two? And we thought this one would be cooler and would be a better advertising piece for IX, which mm -hmm. we use these for. Um, and so we said, yeah, go with the go with the portal. And so this is this is the piece. Um, one of the cool little tidbits about this one is if you look on the astronauts' uh, uniform, they're on their astronaut spacesuits, they all have, uh, they've got patches on the suits of classic cartoon characters. Oh, I just now noticed the heavy metal reference on the guy on the, on the left. <laughs> yep. yep, you've got those, and there's, I forget what, all, there's a speed racer, I think is speed on Speed racer, that. right, yeah, yeah, that's funny. Yeah, yeah that, that's, that's, that's his, that's the, uh, that's, that's the Easter egg. Um, you know, kind of the Easter egg in this piece. Uh, no, I did not notice that before. That's awesome. Yeah, but it's, but, it, but it's, 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 it's an amazing piece. It's, you know, um, we're, we're very happy to have, we, 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 we could not afford to commission this piece now. Um, I don't think any longer. Um, uh, so I'm thrilled that we commissioned him when we did, <laughs> you know, um, you know, Donato is, is, is just gotten, really hot and really good and really um he's been doing these huge tolkien commissions um like you know like nine ten feet wide yeah oh, he's oh, yeah. i thought he was just doing them because they were they're, apparently they're commissioned uh or most of them at least were commissioned um the last one he did is for sale now so i don't know whether the commission didn't go through or whether this one he just painted himself um you know but I mean, of course, it's for sale for one hundred and seventy-five thousand um, dollars. But uh, you know, it's a you know he's he's just he's just doing just amazing stuff. I mean, he's just you know, genie 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 yells at me because every time I'm doing any kind of a speech or any kind of an anything or any kind of a whatever, and I I, I will invariably use Donato as an example of something. Um, you know, because he's just that good. Right. No, I mean, well, he has uh, earned his place to do pretty much whatever he wants. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, he has paid his dues, but he's always been kind of at the top. Of, he, was, uh, he was he was Wunderkind day one. Yeah. I mean, his first covers came out. People were like, holy hell, what is this? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, he was really good like day one. Yeah, uh, Kazra says, I think I remember that Donato was a huge comic book geek. And uh, actually, uh, when I did, when when George Perez was uh, passing away, I did a tribute thing where I had fans send in video clips thanking George while he was still alive. I wanted to put something together. And uh, Donato was one of the, well, there were several artists that did it, but you know, the only artist outside of comic books that uh, had something really wonderful to say to George was uh, Donato. And he, uh, it was really, really touching. He, he had a lot of, 
lot of positive things to say. And so, I, you know, it was just, it was, I wasn't expecting it, you know, because it wasn't something I solicited. And uh, yeah, I mean, so that's, I think that's very true. And again, uh, comics probably influenced a lot of these uh, creators in some way one, or, or another. Donato, um, Donato was a huge D&D game. Yeah. A big part of his influence was D&D. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I've seen, I've seen the, you know, the drawings, the, the 10 year old Donato drawings. Of, you know, right, right. Person that, you know, I mean, he, he, he was a huge role playing guy, which is, that's a huge influence on him. Um, you know, one of his biggest influences was Parkinson. Keith mm -hmm. Parkinson. That makes sense. Yeah but, yeah, but he's, he's, he's just, he's, he's just amazing. Um, you know, and, and, and just, and a cool guy, a really nice guy. I like Donato a lot. Actually, yeah. Interesting. I, I've, I've, I've said, I've said, I've talked to people a bunch of, you know, and I've said that it, you know, this field, both the collectors and the artists, you know, just seem to have a way lower asshole quotient than society at large. Um, you know, not that there's none, uh, not that we have not had the occasional sociopath that we have to deal with, <laughs> um, but by and large, just an incredibly nice, cool, good batch of people. Um, you know, I mean, it's the, you know, and, and even, you know, it, it's just really, it's just really interesting. I mean, it, it's just, there's so, you know, there's so few assholes, um, you know. <laughs> Marcus says he's here. <laughs> well, I said few, I didn't say that. <laughs> and Patrick doesn't even know you, Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> just taking your word for it yeah <laughs> oh man uh well we do have one more artwork to look at and uh <laughs> this is uh let me pull this one up here this is by john harris and it, it's, uh, it's it's entitled the search it's and it's it's stunning but you know this one i'm not uh I, I don't know if i've ever seen this one before so tell me a bit about it you probably haven't uh because that was ix Okay. Um, because I think John came to IX2, brought a whole bunch of little pieces with him. Nobody bought anything except us. We bought one small piece. Um, we asked him if he would if he would come back the next year and if he would do a commission. And he said, Well, he wasn't sure that he, he would be coming back and he wasn't sure, so he, he would thank you, but but he would pass. Um, and then about two months later, three months later, I got an email from him saying, you know, actually he thought he would come back and, and he'd had an idea for a painting. Um, and, and were we okay with, with just him doing his idea and, and was it okay if it was big? And I said, well, well, yeah, absolutely. That's amazing. Awesome. Wonderful. Fantastic. So he said, great. And he went away. Like four months later, um, uh, he sends an email and says, here it is. It's done. Uh, it's called the search. It's 42 by 60. Um, and it is actually, it's, it's hanging, it's on the wall right next to me. I'm, I'm looking at it right now. It's actually on the wall, an entryway wall. It'll, it's probably going to get relocated downstairs shortly so I can rehang the Braum, which hasn't even been unpacked yet. Um, but, uh, but it's, it's fabulous. Um, and it's, it's, it's the search. And the idea is that this spaceship is, is searching through the universe, looking for signs of life and everywhere, all it finds are ruins of dead civilizations um where there was life but it's gone now um and so it's this constant search for for something that's actually currently thriving as opposed to this this ruined you know mm -hmm. nothingness um so that's the you know the, the thing and this one this one and, and, and this, is, this this is this is what we tell people this is this is you know how how marketing and shows works um, you know, John came the first year and he brought a bunch of, of small pieces that he painted to fit in a suitcase. And I said, we bought one um, and nobody else bought any. So the next year he came back and he brought a bunch of small pieces that he could fit in a suitcase um, and studies. And we had this painting. And he hung this painting on his wall and surrounded it with the smaller pieces and sold every single piece he brought with him plus sold pieces off of Xeroxes that he happened to have uh, to show other things that he had at home. Wow. Um, and we said, yeah, it's because people would walk by 
and they see this and it's like, oh my God. And then they go and they look and then they want, you know, something, you know, they want, they want something manageable and they want, and right. so they bought the stuff. Um, you know, uh, John is amazing. He's, he's brilliant. He's, you know, I've said that if, if, if in 50 years from now or a hundred years from now, um, if there is an imaginative artist who is in the art textbooks, it is most likely to be John Harris. Um, you know, he, 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 he may be the most likely to, to make that transition. Uh, you know, he's already got some a little more academic recognition. Uh, you know, the, uh, the Tate Gallery did a, a, a John Martin exhibition. Um, and if you're not familiar with uh, the 19th century artist John Martin and his apocalyptic paintings, you need to go look at them because they're fucking cool. Uh, we paint, you know, the, the, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and the massive flood and the explosion. Just this mm -hmm. huge, just, just massive, the gates of Pandemonium, just massive mayhem, just amazing, huge, beautiful, gorgeous remaining paintings. Um, and, uh, they did an exhibition of his work and uh, they actually had John contribute to uh, the catalog for, for the Martin exhibition uh, because John's work was so heavily influenced by Martin. Well, I mean, I can see why you would say that about John, because as far as being uh, somebody who would be recognized 50 or hundred years from now, I mean, he's prolific. He's influenced so many artists uh, you know, many comic artists too. I mean, you know, that would uh, would probably list him as uh, as an influence. Many many painters. You know, spent, there's no way Bill Sienkiewicz doesn't say John Harris was somebody that whose work he admired. For instance, I mean, there's just too many yeah. to uh, to name. So uh, no, I I could see that, and uh, yeah, his artwork has graced a lot of uh, popular uh, paperback books. Uh, he's 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 touched a lot of different uh, IP properties as well. I mean, he's just yeah. And deservedly so. I mean, for somebody to work that long, and he's uh, he's in his mid seventies now, and still still working. So yeah, I mean, he's he's an amazing gentleman. The cool thing, one of the cool things about John is that all of the the book covers are the book covers, <clears throat> but when he does his personal works and his personal series, um, all of those paintings and all of those works are based on visions mm -hmm. that him of other places and other times. Um, you know, which is. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, Stanley asked kind of a similar question. Do artists ever add writings to accompany the art? And I think that some some do. I remember, sure. I, I think when I was looking, I was looking at those photos, Rob, Rob Ray writes a little bit, mm -hmm. something that goes along that accompanies a lot of his pieces. And yeah. and yeah, I mean, you figure a lot of the pieces that you see at IX or that these uh, artists are creating, you know, really are coming from their own narratives. You know, they have an idea. And sure, sometimes, you know, because that painting that you showed us wouldn't have maybe had the same bearing, but now you say he's, you know, the dead civilization after dead, you know, now that's, that's cool. Now there's something really uh, that you can latch on to that you don't, now you don't, it doesn't, I don't even care if it's published, right? I've got like the story, the art, this was their idea and their concept. Well, and, and there's, there's also, there's also a case of ours where they, they are working on things that were where they have the narrative, they have the stories, they just don't, they haven't written them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I have been harassing Lars Grant West for years. Uh, you know, Lars did a painting called Cyber Dragon uh, many years ago. Fabulous painting. Um, and it was this, it was going to be, the, 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 he had an idea for this whole world based around this, this painting. Um, and uh, when we, it's not one of the ones I included, but when we commissioned him to do an IX piece, we commissioned him to do another painting from that world from that narrative and that's packed to the blind um and which which he did and that's it he, he's never he's never done any any of the other stuff because he's still busy doing magic card paintings and cleaning his skeletons and doing the stuff that he he hasn't done any any of that stuff right you know and i i Grass him periodically because it was it was a great story. <laughs> it was a good story. It was a good world. You, could, you know, but he just hasn't gotten to it. And there, I think there's a lot of 
you know, the artists, they, they have that narrative. They have those stories. And they just mm -hmm. don't get to it. So there you go, Stanley. Yes, uh, there's. it does happen, at least, uh, you know, to a certain degree. Um, but, uh, Patrick, man, this has been a lot of fun. I know we, we, we I think we really should do that other, uh, you know, lecture when yeah. you're up for it and maybe, maybe, uh, maybe dig it, dig out the PowerPoint and, uh, and, and look it over and see if there's anything you need, need to add. And then we should yeah. set a date to it. I mean, it'll be mostly you. I'll, I'll be happy to kind of steer the ship behind the scenes, but I think yeah. it would be great. I mean, I, I really want to use the platform to educate as much as yeah. possible. Yeah. I'm all for it. And I'll, well, I'll send you the PowerPoint. Okay. So yeah, you can see and, and think, hey, is there anything we can add or anything we could do that would be cool to make this a better, you know, to make this a cooler presentation of, of you know, of stuff since we have capabilities of doing things yeah. here and stuff. So, so I'll, I'll just send it to you and you can, you can check it out. Awesome. And, uh, well, I'm sorry, Jeannie couldn't be here with us today. She would have been uh, excellent to have, have uh, just for part of it. I mean, I know she's been a, a, a really important part of uh the whole ix process and uh she's always an absolute pleasure to hang around just like you are but you know she, she's made the show very you know again it's it, but it's fun i mean and i think that uh as a team you know you guys have been phenomenal and you've done incredible things for uh for that genre i know that, you know you have the respect of the artists and the collectors and uh and you know the, you know the one thing have you has have they ever sent a news crew over to IX when the show's going on there? I feel like I've never seen a, like a camera. Why, why isn't like They're, local media needs to walk through a few times? They, they, they don't do it regularly, but they've been, you know, we've had, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if Allentown ever did or not. They might have. Uh, but Altoona has and, uh, and Reading has. Okay. But, but only once. Like, they do it once. They don't do it every, they don't, they don't do it every year, which they should. They should. Uh, they should. But they, uh, I'll have to, you know, have to continue to harass them a little more so we can get them. <laughs> Marcus, they actually do have a cut. It's the weekend before Halloween, so back at the hotel on uh, Friday or Saturday, there's usually some kind of, uh, you know, people dressing up one way or another. It's not, it, and it's semi-organized in its own its own yeah. little way, but uh, um, not not sanctioned by Patrick and Jeannie. It just happens naturally. It's, sometimes it's organized, and sometimes it's, but yeah, people will. People will sometimes when it's when it's right when it's right before Halloween, uh, people will sometimes they will dress up on for the showcase uh, Wednesday night, and sometimes mm -hmm. it's people just wearing costumes, and other times it's they coordinated that they you have forty people wearing Wonder Woman costumes because Wonder Woman was big that year, and so they're all being Wonder Woman. Um, so there's those kinds of things, and then we've had you know the uh, and then we've, we've had judges come and judge the, the costumes and you know we give prizes to the to the way we don't do we don't we don't do that every year but we've done that we've had like John Shindahedi and people do the judging. There you go. See Marcus uh yeah it's it is happening. Yeah. Um but Patrick man this has been a lot of fun obviously uh it, it, you know and it's funny for as long as I've known you I've never asked you any of those questions. I never knew what your origin story was after you know I just kind of uh kind of became your friend at a time when you were doing cool things and uh, and you know that's usually enough but I, I i was going into this kind of blind not knowing what the answers were going to be for uh for how you got started so yeah. i had no idea that you collected animation cells for instance that's hopefully they were at least interesting yes absolutely well, it, was, it, was, it was an interesting interesting background and and you know no well and very different than than uh, many other uh collector interviews that i've done that's for sure let, let's get at least at least we're at least we're, we're unique <laughs> yes well listen I, I, we're gonna call it a night but i i, I appreciate uh, you taking the time out patrick to do this i know we're gonna do something again soon and uh for everybody who's been watching tonight again thank you for tuning in uh, i'll keep you posted when we're gonna do that uh the origins of the genre uh you know maybe in a few months but uh you know i'll let you know when that's gonna happen and again patrick thank you so much you know if there's ever anything you need i'm i'm here to help uh do some pr for you you are, you know, you, you we, we have we have the list of people, you know, we have, we have list of people, okay, these people are going to, and then we have the list of people that, okay, if you need something or these are the people that you can trust with anything that you might need, and you are on that list of people, so therefore, you know, you, you know, you yeah, actually you are on the if the zombies are invading and I've been bitten and have to be shot. And someone, I need to hand Jeannie over to somebody. You're on the list of people that would 
that would get Jeannie if I, if I can make the trip up there, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Patrick. Hey, and don't, don't uh, click log off because I want to talk to you about that, that one thing uh, we were talking about before the show. All right, everybody have a wonderful night. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see.